All right. Okay, so, <clears throat> so yesterday, guys, that to, well, today is the 9th of February, 2021. We are in technically our day two of oxygen therapy or medical gas therapy. Uh, on the last unit, I gave you guys an extra day uh, to take that exam. And so that put us back a day. There's no way that I can push it back a day all the way through the syllabus. You know, I got days for lab and test and I, I, I go back a day on all of them. And people who have made all of these um, arrangements to be off work when I first sent this would be all thrown off. So we have to make that day up. And I told you every now and then, if we get to a subject that's a little bit, seem like it's taking a little bit more to get it through to you, I may give an extra day, but that just means that's a, a less day on the next one. And so in that case, I gave you guys a lecture, okay? It would have been the same lecture if I started today. Uh, I gave it to you yesterday, so you could watch it yesterday, take notes with the note-taking guide, uh, be doing your reading, and be prepared for pop quiz today. So it was just like I was teaching it. So then you really got two things out of one. You got a test and your uh, lab yesterday, and then you got the new information, okay? So that we could stay on task because this lab coming is a nice size lab. You have oxygen flow systems. So you're gonna have low flow devices, high flow devices, uh, and understanding how they work. We got magic box, total flow, all those type of things are in this unit. This is where the, you know, uh, I keep saying that, but this is, you know, you did the ABGs, that's very important. Uh, but now we're going to into the part of how do we deliver this therapy uh, to our patients? And then what do we use, right? It's kind of like you have a, a toolbox. And if you have a toolbox or, you know, a kitchen drawer that's got tools in it or whatever, you have to decide what you want to use, uh, men and women. And so as a respiratory therapist, you have a vast toolbox at your disposal. Anything from a regular little nasal cannula that goes in your nose all the way down to life support, right? And different modalities in that life support to sustain life, okay? And you have to know, what, what do I reach for? If he's a little bit hypoxic, do I want to go put him on life support just because he's a little low on his oxygen? No, we want to start low, right? You only want to give enough oxygen to uh, treat the hypoxemia, all right? You just want to give enough. Uh, and so with that being said, you will have a pop quiz today on what you learned last night. It's only one question. It's not a whole lot drawn out uh, questions. There's one question. should be simple. If you looked at it and started taking your notes, then you shouldn't have any problem with that. It is worth 25 points because you're gonna have four pop quizzes, 25 points a piece to be 100% uh, for your K, or RT210K's homework, remember that. Uh, I haven't been taken off for homework since we've been started, but I told you, as we go on, if you don't do your homework, not only will you not get that attendance for that day, but you will be knocked off points. Uh, when I showed you guys the spreadsheet that we take for homework, you'll notice that it is 100% on the other side for everybody's homework. Homework A, B, C, D, all the way to J is 100. We start you off with 100. But when you don't do one, I can take points off. So if you have five of them, of course, they're 20 points apiece. So if you don't do one, then you got an 80. If you don't do but one of them, then you have a 20% for that homework grade. And since K is CPR, we don't have homework for K. We're using pop quizzes to suffice for that, to ensure that the students are participating, studying, uh, and making sure you're keeping up with it, because it could be it could be from anything from A to now. This pop quiz that you're going to take today, which is pop quiz number two, you will log in at 1:20. It will be open at 1:20, so I'll stop enough time to let you do that. It's, you have one minute to answer the question. So it's open from 1.20 to 1.30, but once you open it, you only have one minute to answer that question, okay? And then we got to keep going. With that being said, let's go back. Um, I introduced you yesterday to medical gas therapy. Uh, you finished the oxygen cylinders, cylinder gases, the physics of cylinder gases. How do they 
uh, behave in our atmosphere, the, the pressures that they exert alone or all together, right? The different laws that we learn in, about the gas physics. Uh, we even talked about temperature and we said all gases are, the temperature are measured in Kelvin, right? And so you gotta have be able to go back and remember how do I get killed? Stuff like that. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about uh, we left off the, the 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 lecture from last night left off at low flow devices, and I it gave you the PowerPoint. Now I will show you really quick uh, as we record the note taking guide as far as the lesson plan, so you can go back and pause it tonight and fill in anything that you didn't think that you filled in with the PowerPoint. However. The PowerPoint is pretty much word for word from the lesson plan, but I will do that. Okay, I will do that. So let me share my screen because we got to move forward. All right. Now I will go over this. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if the lecture talked about the the um, uh, objectives. I'm pretty sure it did, but we'll go over right quick the objectives. All right, so the student will be able to discuss the three indications for oxygen. If you looked at it, it told you, uh, the lecture told you last night, the three reasons why we give oxygen. Yeah, one second. All right, we're gonna to get to all of those low flow devices today. That's what we're gonna to do today, okay? Now, you'll be able to discuss the three indications. Indications are why do we give oxygen? Uh, the four hazards of oxygen, because of anything, too much of anything is a hazard. And the lecture told you guys yesterday, uh, the four hazards of oxygen therapy. I expect you to be abreast of them, just like if I would have been there teaching it live. Uh, the rules for giving oxygen. We're gonna, you're gonna learn how to discuss hyperbaric op oxygen therapy. And that is when we go down some atmospheres in a hyperbaric chamber. We talked about that a little bit in the last uh, lesson. Uh, then you'll also be able to uh, correctly assemble testing function, the nasal cannula, simple oxygen mask, the partial rebreather, non-rebreather, the Venturi mask, oxygen tent, a croupette, and an isolate. All of these things are your domain. When you go to the hospital, you're in the NICU and the baby is in a little incubator, that is your domain, that is respiratory. Uh, that is your responsibility to make sure the heat is right, the oxygen flow is right, the amount of oxygen is right, the noise is not too much, that is your baby, okay? The croup tent, when a patient has croup, little baby has croup, there's a tent that you can set up around the bed for a croupette. And so all of these, these are in your toolbox. All of these things here are in your toolbox. And you as the respiratory therapist have to decide when and why do I use each one? Because if you don't know which one to use then how can you do therapy? You are a respiratory therapist. So you want to give therapy, whether it is oxygen therapy, whether it is uh, percussion therapy, positioning, bronchial hygiene, or life support. That's all you, okay? You're also gonna be able to demonstrate how to analyze the FIO2. That means how do I test it? How do I know that the oxygen coming from this tubing is 40%? How do I know it's not 100%? Well, there's something called an oxygen analyzer that you wanna be using to be able to put it in the flow and it'll tell you, okay? And there's different types of analyzers. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to tell me the difference and how they work. Uh, adjust the delivery device as appropriate and document the oxygen concentration. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, we don't have some of this stuff we don't do in the lab. Uh, you will do a little later. But the pulse oximeter, of course, we know how to do that. Uh, there's a tran transcutaneous monitor. That, that is a skin patch you can put on the pack baby skin or adult skin 
to measure uh, CO2 and oxygen content. <clears throat> There's an in tidal CO2 monitor that uh, directly measures the CO2 as the patient exhales. So if I put a little CO2 detector on your exhale, when the patient exhales, it should be full of what? CO2. And it changes a certain color, a number, or whatever one you're, you're using. That is an in tidal. So that's at the end of your tidal volume, right? Tidal volume, normal in, normal out, normal in, normal out. So in tidal means at the end of your regular tidal volume breath, uh, there should be an amount of CO2 that's detectable. Okay, and we use an entitled CO2 monitor for that. Okay, all right, so let's go through this. Let me show you <clears throat> up to far. We went right here. These were the indications for uh, oxygen therapy here. We talked about those in the lesson plan. I'm um, not the lesson plan, but the lecture last night. Okay, all right, so I'm just going through them so that you can see them. And you can go back home and pause it, fill in anything in your note taking guide that you need to. But if you watched it last night, it goes word for word in the PowerPoint. So you should already have all of this if you watched it. Right? Then it got to the hazards of O2 therapy, which is oxygen toxicity was the first one. Absorption atelectasis is the second one. Oxygen induced hypoventilation, third one. And then retinopathy of prematurity or retrolineal fibroplasia. Both of those pretty much the same thing. We talked about that in lab ourselves. Having a P little a O2 greater than 80 for an extended period of time can cause blindness in your baby. So that's how you, that's why we have to know how much are we giving them, okay? All right, we stopped with this one yesterday. The lecture stopped with the guidelines for O2 administration. I will go over these guidelines to remember this. Oxygen concentrations less than 40% rarely ever cause oxygen toxicity. Okay, just remember that. <laughs> because some of those hazards that you learned were saying uh, they were very important. Who can tell me the two mo main components of oxygen toxicity? What, is, what does it have to be? For oxygen That's toxicity. Huh? FiO2 greater than 50% over 24 hours. So high FiO2 and time, right? So for oxygen toxicity, it's high FiO2 and time. What about uh, absorption atelectasis? What are the two main components for absorption atelectasis? High FiO2 and an obstruction. There you go. High FiO2s and obstruction. That you have to have those two in order to have um, O2 induced, I mean, I'm sorry, um, absorption atelectasis. For absorption atelectasis, it has to be high FiO2 and an obstruction, right? For oxygen toxicity, we said that it had to be a higher FiO2 over 24 hours. So time, make sure you understand that. Great, great job, Michaelin. That is Michaelin, right? Or was that Maria? Yeah, it's Michaelin. Michael, good, good job. So if you guys watched it and took the notes, you're up to date and up to speed right now. Shapiro uh, is an old school respiratory therapist instructor. He had his own book, just like you use Egan's now. We used to use a book called Shapiro, okay? And he was a very, very um, um, smart respiratory therapist. And he says, to allow a patient to be exposed to dangerous levels of hypoxia for the fear of oxygen toxicity is intolerable. Because you learn that Certain patients, and you're going to learn it as we go, certain patients are sensitive to oxygen, right? Because of the peripheral chemoreceptors and the central chemoreceptor situation, some patients you don't want to give too much oxygen to. Who can tell me what patient do we have to really watch the amount of oxygen that we give to? DOPDers. DOPDers, because if you give them too much, right, that will cause them mm -hmm. to slow their breathing down. And that is called... Uh, O2 induced hypoventilation. All right, great job, great job. Because if they they don't use, remember we said uh, we learned about the peripheral chemoreceptors and the central chemoreceptor. We said the central chemoreceptors respond to CO2, central CO2. Remember I said that uh, I think a couple of units ago, and the peripheral chemoreceptors respond to hypoxemia, which is a low 
PaO2, right? So peripheral PaO2. And we said the peripheral chemoreceptors have two types, carotid bodies and aortic bodies, right? And so um, we said the aortic bodies, when they sense a low PaO2, they make the heart pump a little harder and tell the body to breathe a little bit faster. Well, the carotid bodies, they pretty much just focus on ventilation. When those carotid bodies learn or feel or detect a low oxygen, they make you breathe faster. Well, all of us who are healthy use both peripheral and central chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptor was when you had CO2 in the cerebral spinal fluid. We said CO2 diffuses in and out with no problem. When the, when the carbon dioxide in the cerebral spinal fluid starts getting high, the central chemoreceptors say, hey, wake up. You need to breathe, right? All right. Well, in our COPD patients, don't forget, they have smoked away their central chemoreceptor. You can look at it like that. Their CO2 is so high all the time that they have messed that system up. And so now they do not live off their central chemoreceptors. The COPD only responds to the uh, peripheral chemoreceptors. And that's why we always want them to be a little bit what? COPD is, we always want them to be a little bit hypoxic, excellent. Because if they're hypoxic, that's what makes them breathe, right? They, their uh, peripheral chemoreceptors say, hey, your oxygen's a little low. Hey, wake up, breathe. And that's how they breathe. They don't deal with CO2 anymore. They deal with their PaO2 being low. So what if you go into Uncle Fred's room, who's a smoker, been smoking for 35 years. He has COPD. He's on an oxygen concentrator in his room. And you see that his saturations is like 92, 91. And you're like, ooh, let me cut your oxygen up, Mr. Uncle Fred. You cut Uncle Fred's oxygen up, and he goes up to 100%, and his, he is no longer hypoxic, okay? You leave out the room for the Super Bowl. You leave out the room, go fix his food. You come back into the room, and he is barely breathing or almost dead because you have knocked out his drive to breathe. The COPD are only breathes when they sense their self being hypoxic, okay? If they're not hypoxic, they will not breathe, okay? And so we always, now I'm not saying 70% or we don't want their PaO2 to be severe. We don't want their P little AO2 to be 25 or 30, right? We just want them to be mildly hypoxic, right? And anything less than 80 is mild. So if they're like, 75, 70 of a PaO2, that's fine. That's mildly hypoxic, and that is what keeps them living, okay? It's just like you. If you know what is your drive to live, something that if I took it from you, you could no longer live again, okay? That is how hypoxia is for the COPD. -er. That is what we call hypoxic drive, okay? That is what makes them wanna live. And if you take that away from them, then they don't let you. I know you were trying to help. You thought you were helping because you made his sack go up and all of that, right? He's no longer hypoxic. You thought you were helping, but you actually killed him, okay? But Shapiro is saying right here, to allow him to have moderate or severe hypoxemia just because you're scared to give oxygen will be a fool. Don't be a fool is what he's saying, okay? Nobody can live with... A, uh, severe hypoxemia, okay? You got to give it to them. You can't say, uh, I can't give you this because if I give you this, you're going to die, right? You can't do that. Uh, did that little cartoon play for y'all last night? Oh, you didn't watch You didn't watch the lecture? That's what I'm talking about, on the lecture. Yeah, but it was uh, hard to watch. It was really, like, grainy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try to find it again today. Uh, it simply was saying that there was a nurse talking to the uh, uh, a, a man who was had COPD, and he said, "I got I'm short of breath, I really can't breathe. Can you give me some oxygen?" And she said, "No, I can't give you oxygen because you got COPD. Right? You can't do that." And then finally, he turns blue. He's suffering from, you know, severe hypoxemia. And then the respiratory therapist comes in the room and says, "You know, give him some oxygen, right?" So don't hold oxygen back 
because of the fear of oxygen toxicity, okay? Because everybody needs to be uh, get some oxygen if they need it, okay? So just remember uh, that. Now, that's what Shapiro says. Also, E says use minimal oxygen to achieve no hypoxemia. So that's when we talk about the, uh, the uh, toolbox. If all you need is a screwdriver, then don't go get a power axe. You don't need all of that, right? If you're trying to open up something and all you need is a little screwdriver, you know, if I get a screwdriver, I can pop the lid off of it. I don't need to go and get a, the jaws of life from the fire department to pop open a can of tuna fish, right? You only use what you need to achieve no hypoxemia. So if I have a patient who's hypoxic and I got a nasal cannula and I put them on two liters or one liter and that fixes it, then stop there. Don't go to eight liters and a mask and a ventilator and life support just because he was a little, his sat was a little low, okay? You only use enough to achieve no hypoxemia, okay? And always monitor your patients closely. And when we say that, that also means know your patient, check the chart, know who you're dealing with. Because if you're dealing with a COPD, you have to deal with them a little bit different than you would somebody who does not have COPD, okay? People who don't have COPD, you don't want them to be hypoxic at all, all right? But if he does have COPD, then it's, it's understandable. So you have to know who you're dealing with. Okay, so that is a kind of a, a um, review of what you learned last night. Uh, and we're going to go on in back to the PowerPoint talking about low flow systems. You have two types of systems when we're giving oxygen. It's either low flow or high flow. That's it. Okay, now there's a lot of things that are in each category. But as far as the categories are concerned, you're either going to be low flow or you're giving them high flow. So today we're going to talk about both uh, systems and we're going to first talk about the indications. Oh, I messed up my little time. I change it. My indications for low flow devices. OK, indications for low flow devices and indications for high flow. Really not hard. OK, really not hard. Just have to think every time you uh, are thinking, does this patient qualify for a low flow or does he qualify for a high flow system? All right, so let me get that out. And before we get into those low flow, low flow, high flow systems, we're getting ready to take this pop quiz. I'll let you know when to log. I'm going to have to change my time a little bit because I, I went over. Open till 130. Let me just change this time. So. All right, you don't have to cut your camera on and all that, it's not that big of a deal, all right? But what I want you guys to do now is to go to, um, go to the module and go down to where it says, it should be right up under the, the, uh, the Zoom link. See this right here? Go to the module and go to where it says pop quiz number two. You're in this module, medical gas therapy. So I'm gonna go down here to medical gas therapy All right, so medical gas therapy right here, which says pop quiz number two. I want you guys to hit it, and you have one minute to answer that question for your pop quiz for today. So here it is right here. Pop quiz number two under medical gas therapy. Go to the medical gas therapy. Click on pop quiz number two and answer the one question. Okay, after that, we'll go into the PowerPoint of low flow and high flow systems. So the pop quiz is complete. Three reasons why we give oxygen therapy is to treat hypoxemia, decrease the work of the lungs, and decrease the work of the heart. Because when we are hypoxic, the lungs work harder, right? They start breathing a little bit harder uh, because they like, what's going on? I'm, I'm trying to get more in for you, right? And then the heart also works harder. It will increase in rate, increase in strength, because the heart is what pushes oxygenated blood 
to the body. And if some reason the body's saying, hey, I'm not getting enough, then the heart's saying, well, let me kick in overtime. Let me do more to get that oxygen there. So it's working harder, okay? And so that's why we give oxygen um, in those situations because we don't want the, work, the, the lungs to have to work hard. We don't want the heart to have to work hard. We have to help by giving a little oxygen. And something as simple as a low flow device can stop all of that, right? Because we said we only give enough to treat or prevent hypoxemia, okay? So you as a respiratory therapist are the key. All right, so let's look at the PowerPoint. All right, go back to the PowerPoint. Hold on one second. Just do it like this, man. All right, here we go. Pick up where we left off. Slide show. Slide. Can everybody see my screen? You see the PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Here we go. We already did this part. While we give oxygen, talked about the chemo, the decreasing the work of breathing, decreasing the work of the heart, hazards. And we ended up with the RLF, ROP and the guidelines, okay? Today, we're gonna to talk about the low flow systems. So indications for low flow systems, low flow devices. Patients with a tidal volume of 300 to 700, respiratory rate lower than 25, and a consistent regular ventilatory pattern. These are the three indications or low flow device. A patient must have respiratory rate, you know, 25 or less, consistent, regular ventilatory pattern. That's very important. And the tidal volume should range around 300 to 700. If that, and that should be everybody that's listening to me right now. All of us right now are breathing regular, consistent ventilatory pattern. Nobody in here is hyperventilating, huffing and puffing. Uh, taking in super large tidal volumes, right? Or breathing 40 times a minute. None of us are, okay? We are all breathing consistent, regular ventilatory pattern at a respiratory rate of 25 or less. They qualify for low flow systems, okay? So if their oxygen is a little low and they are showing me these indications, then I can use a low flow system out of my toolbox. So let's talk about the low flow systems. There's some good things and some disadvantages for low flow systems. Uh, the FIO2 will vary according to the patient's ventilatory pattern. So I cannot guarantee the FIO2 in a low flow system. Okay, make sure you highlight what I just said. In a low flow system, I cannot guarantee an FIO2. I can estimate, but I cannot guarantee because of their ventilatory pattern. Remember, we talked about in depth when I said, um, when somebody is breathing on a nasal cannula, they have holes, right? Let me show you, I'm gonna get out the first low flow device. All right, our first low flow device is this right here.
first low flow device, oxygen cannula. All right. This is an oxygen cannula. Okay. Also known as a binasal cannula because you have two nares and these go up into your nose, thus like this. Behind the ears and then under the chin. Notice how the oxygen that's going in, if as long as I'm breathing normal, consistent ventilatory pattern, then I can estimate about what his FIO2 or my FIO2 is going to be getting, okay? Uh, but if I start breathing like that, I'm sucking in so much outside air that I'm decreasing the content of the FIO2. I'm decreasing the FIO2 coming from the actual cannula, okay? So that's not going to work for them, all right? Somebody who's breathing inconsistent, irregular, 30 times a minute, then they can't severe, they can't, you can't give them a low flow device. Okay. It's not gonna work for them. All right. So that's important. So I cannot guarantee because if he starts breathing super fast, then his FL2 is going to change. So for instance, we talked about the fart in the car, right? If your boyfriend farts in the car with the windows up, the concentration or the FL2 of it's gonna be very, very strong right? But if you let the window down, you now pull in outside air, which will die down the smell, right? Which makes the FIO2 go down, all right? So the higher the flow, the lower the FIO2, okay? The higher the flow, the lower the FIO2. The lower the flow, if I let the windows up, then the FIO2 or the smell gets stronger and stronger, right? So the lower the flow, the higher the potential for the FIO2. So it just depends on how they're breathing, right? So that's why in a low flow device, such as an oxygen cannula, binasal cannula, I cannot guarantee the FIO2. Can't guarantee it, okay? All right, let's continue. All right, what are the factors, like I just said? Some of the factors that influence the probability of the FIO2 are the ventilatory pattern. Everybody say ventilatory pattern. Everybody say it. Ventilatory pattern. Say it again. Ventilatory pattern. Ventilatory pattern. You're going to hear me say that a lot. Okay. The low flow systems depend on the patient's ventilatory pattern the most. Okay. If he's breathing normal, we can use it. If he's not, we cannot use a low flow system. Okay. Uh, so the, the patient's ventilatory pattern, which is his respiratory rate, tidal volume, and IE ratio. That's the inspiratory to expiratory time. Okay. Those are part of the ventilatory pattern. Also, the flow of the gas. The flow of the gas makes a difference. The reservoir size makes a difference. Now, reservoir, what do, you, what do you mean? Reservoir is uh, any space that gathers oxygen, okay? We have anatomical reservoirs and we have system reservoirs, all right? We said once before that if I look at a cross-section of a uh, nasal pharynx, an oral pharynx, okay? If he has a nasal cannula in his nose, Okay, the nasal cannula in his nose. Well, all of this space, guys, all of this back here, all this is what you call anatomical reservoir. Say if I'm only breathing one time a minute, right? So when I take a little breath in and I stop, as I stop, this oxygen is still coming out of this nasal cannula, right? And it's building and filling in my what? Anatomical reservoir. So imagine when I finally do inhale and I suck all this oxygen down to my lungs, the FL2 is going to be really, really high, right? Because I've had so much time to feel in my reservoir space, okay? So that res respiratory rate makes a difference. I mean, what if I'm breathing 50 times a minute? If I'm breathing, if he is breathing 50 times a minute, does oxygen have any time to collect? No. 
No, if I'm breathing 50 times a minute, there's no time for the anatomical reservoir to even collect. Because as soon as I breathe in, I'm breathing again, breathing again, breathing again. And so it just, it doesn't collect, okay? So that's what reservoir size means. The amount of reservoir space, okay? And either it is anatomical, which is your oral pharynx or your nasal pharynx area, or it is a system reservoir, uh, which you will learn a little bit later <clears throat> today, which is the actual mask itself, or the mask has a little bag on it. Those are also known as reservoirs. Anywhere where we can hold oxygen for a minute, okay? <clears throat> Anywhere that I can hold on to some oxygen for a little while, that's considered a reservoir space, okay? Just like you have dead space, when we had anatomical dead space and we had mechanical dead space, Anatomical dead space was anywhere in the body where gas was not exchanging, right? All the conducting zones were considered dead space, right? But then if I had extra tubing on the patient's circuit, that was mechanical dead space, okay? So that's the same thing with a reservoir, all right? Either anatomical reservoir or mechanical reservoir, all right? All right, we're still talking about low flow systems. I haven't gotten into each device yet. I'm just showing you one of them. Uh, for example, but we're talking about low flow devices in general right now. All right. Still talking about the, yes. Okay, so on the homework, it's asking what size of the norm, what size of the normal reservoir, what is the size of normal reservoir? So we would put anywhere in the body where gas is being exchanged. No, no. What what homework are you talking about? It's a uh, homework number two. Number 17 is saying, what is the size of the normal anatomic reservoir? Oh, I, I, that's probably in your book, your normal anatomic reservoir. When, it's, when you look in your book and you see where it talks about the nasal pharynx, oral pharynx as a reservoir, it'll probably give you a amount. I don't, I don't have that amount on top of my head, but you'll okay. learn that as, as we go on. Okay. Now, so okay. the uh, low flow systems uh, is saying that the FL2 will vary according to the patient's ventilatory pattern, okay? Now, those factors that influence the FL2, of course, is the patient's ventilatory pattern when we're dealing with a low-flow system. The reason why I say that is because if we are in a high-flow system, I don't care if you breathe a 1,000 times a minute. If you breathe one time a minute or a 1,000 times a minute, you're going to get a guaranteed FL2 in a high-flow system, but we haven't gotten there yet. So that's why we're making the distinction uh, when I keep saying it over and over again about the low flow systems, okay? Now, so the flow of gas was a confact, uh, uh, contributing factor for FIO2. The ventilatory pattern is a contributing factor for the FIO2, right? Uh, anatomical or system reservoir size, that matters, right? Let's look at C. Uh, as the tidal volume increases, the FIO2 will do what? Decrease because of more entrainment. Just like the window, if I let the window down, I have more air in training, so the FL2 or the concentration of the fart will go way down because I'm outside air. That's what you do. When somebody farts, you open up the window, right? So you cannot let the fart out, but let the smell down, okay? The concentration of the smell, right? Just like Kool-Aid. If I have a pack of Kool-Aid and I pour a whole pack of powder Kool-Aid and two drops of water, the concentration of the Kool-Aid is going to be extreme, right? But if I put two gallons of water on it, now I can barely taste the Kool-Aid, right? So when I increase the outside flow, which is called air entrainment, right? Here goes that word right here. Air entrainment, they're saying as the tidal volume increases, so as the volume increases, the FIO2 has to decrease due to more entrainment of room air. How much, what percent of oxygen is room air? 21%. 21%. 21%. Good. So the more 21 you put on it, right, the more water you put on the Kool-Aid, the less the concentration of the Kool-Aid will be. Okay? And the opposite is also true. As the tidal volume decreases, then the FL2 is going to jump up because of less entrainment of room air. So as somebody farts and the windows are down, you, you smell it, right? You're like, oh, somebody, somebody farted, right? But if I let them windows up and I don't pull in outside air anymore, now you're going to know for sure somebody farted, right? Because it's the concentration is going to be super high, right? 
it's going to be really, really hot. So as the volume goes down, the FL2 goes up. And as the volume goes up, the FL2 will go down based on the principle of dilution. Okay, so all you're doing is either diluting it or not diluting. Okay, we dilute the FL2 with room air. Okay, so if I have somebody who's getting oxygen and I don't want them like a COPD, right? What is the percentage of oxygen coming from this, this cylinder right here? If I turn this cylinder on, what percentage of FL2? 100%. 100%. Can a, F, can a COPD have 100% all day long? No. 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 So how do I make this go down? How do I get the FL2 to go down? Add water. No. I mean air, air. Room air. There you go. Adding in training room air. By adding some outside air in, now I can dilute or blend that down, right? And I showed you there'll be ways that we can do it. Or there's also those little machines called blenders that I showed you yesterday in lab that you hook up air and oxygen to it and just turn the FL2 to what you want and it will bleed it down for you, okay? So the only way I can get that FL2 down is if I add outside air, okay? Good, good job. All right, one more concept. We'll, we'll finish this slide and then we'll take a break. Uh-oh, my bad. <clears throat> now, we talked about how the volume affects the FL2, but what about the respiratory rate? Okay, think about this before you answer. How will the respiratory rate affect my FIO2? Well, it's gonna be based on the reservoir, right? I told you, if the, look at, look at D. No, I'm sorry, it's E. As the respiratory rate increases, the FIO2 will go down due to less time for the reservoir to fill up, okay? Again, if I have a oral pharynx here, right? And as soon as you get the oxygen in, if he's breathing regular, it has time to build, right? That oxygen that's coming out that cannula will build for a little while, build, and then breathe. Build, breathe, right? As you breathe, in, out, in, out, right? That's normal. But if I'm breathing, breathe, 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 right? The FL2 can't build up because I have no time to build it up in the reservoir space, right? So the more I have right here, if I breathe really, really slow, right? Say I breathe two times a minute. So I breathe and hold it. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. See that? If I do that, then while I'm holding all this nasal cannula, it's still pouring up into my space. It's filling all of my anatomical reservoir. So when I do decide to finally suck it in, all of that cloud of oxygen goes down at one time. That's gonna give me a high concentration, okay? But if I'm breathing real fast, it has no time to build. So it's just gonna be, you know, uh, it's gonna decrease my FO2 because I'm breathing real fast. I'm pulling in all that outside air and it's just going down, straight down, straight down. It's mixing, going down, mixing, going down. So it would never have a chance to build up, okay? So respiratory rate has to do with the reservoir, okay? Has to do with the reservoir. So my respiratory rate, if you wanna think of F and F, that's fine. Uh, my respiratory rate will affect my FIO2 because of reservoir filling time, okay? My respiratory rate will affect my FIO2 because of my reservoir filling time. So as my respiratory rate increases, my FIO2 will go down because of less time to fill. And as my respiratory rate decreases, then my FIO2 will increase due to more time for reservoir fill. So think of it like this. Think if, if I gave you, if you were hungry and I gave you, you ain't ate in two days and I gave you a, a morsel, like a breadcrumb, one breadcrumb at a time, would you ever get full? Would you ever even know you're eating? You won't even feel no. like you're eating, right? Because, you, you know, it's just nothing, right? It's nothing there. 
But what if I give, you know, you know, it's, it's going down so fast that it seems like it's just one morsel at a time. But what if I stuff your whole mouth full of a whole pizza and then you finally swallow, you finally swallow that, right? You're going to feel like you're full, okay? Because it's all been collecting right there. You, I gave you morsel and you just held it in your mouth and you finally swallow a big, solid piece of food, right? So it, it, it kind of, it's kind of like that. Like I say, think of your own way to remember it. But as my respiratory rate, if I breathe fast, the FO2 is going to go down because I don't have time for it to feel. If I breathe slow, then the FO2 that I get is going to be higher because it has more time to build up. Okay? All right. And then G, remember this. FO2 is unpredictable. I can, I can guess, but I cannot guarantee. In a low flow system, I cannot guarantee the FO2. I can estimate, and I'm going to show you how we estimate it, but I cannot guarantee it. For the most part, it is immeasurable. It may vary from minute to minute, depending on the patient's ventilatory pattern. If I'm breathing slow with the nasal cannula, it may build up some more. If I start breathing real, real fast, it's going to go down because I'm pulling in all of this outside air. Okay, so I can't say how much FO2 he's getting for sure on a low flow system. I can estimate based on how he's breathing, but I cannot guarantee, All right? So that is uh, the most important thing about low flow systems that the FO2 varies from, it varies from the volume and it varies because of the rate. It will vary because of the ventilatory pattern, okay? All right, so let's take a 10 minute break. It's two o'clock, come back at 2.10, and we're gonna go into the next part. Come back at 2.10, and we're gonna go into showing you some of these low flow devices. All right, guys. So we're gonna go into our low flow system. You see my, does my background look different now? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was just trying something. I didn't know this math is weird. Yeah. Okay. I still look good, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now I was just trying something. I don't think I like this. So, yeah. All right. So let's continue on with the actual um, PowerPoint. All right, so the low flow system, low flow devices that I'm talking about, not the system, but the low flow devices that are in the low flow system. First one is the nasal cannula. The nasal cannula is our first low flow device uh, in the low flow system, okay? Remember, in order to qualify for a low flow system, Patient must have a respiratory rate of 25 or less, right? Uh, 300 to 700 tidal volume and a constant, consistent ventilatory pattern. If they have that, then they qualify for our low flow systems, okay? And the first low flow system is the uh, nasal cannula, the first device. So here it is right here, the nasal cannula. You look at the paper, uh, the PowerPoint. This is the nasal cannula, also known as the binasal cannula or nasal prongs, okay? Then if that's not enough, we can move up to a simple oxygen mask. This is called a simple O2 mask. You see it has a mask and a small bore tube and connected to it, okay? This is a simple oxygen mask or also known as a simple O2 mask. Then if that's not enough, we can go up to a non-rebreather or partial rebreather mask, okay? So this one right here is a non-rebreather mask and the partial rebreather mask looks just like it, but you're gonna find there's just a couple of things that are different, all right? All right, so let's look at them. 
First, we're going to talk about, show you the nasal cannula. This is the nasal cannula here. Okay. Hook it up to my oxygen flow device or my tank or whatever, and I'll put this on the patient. Now, he doesn't have ears, so it's not going to stay on him well, but that will be how the nasal cannula is placed. Okay. Depending on how he breathes, he will get <clears throat> his flow, okay? If he breathes really, really fast, then he won't have much time for his reservoir to build up. So breathing really, really fast will decrease his FiO2 amount. If he breathes really, really slow, then he gets more time for his anatomical reservoir to fill, and that can increase his FiO2, okay? If he breathes a lot of flow in, right? Through these nasal, his nares. If you have extra air going through here, not only the oxygen coming from the cannula, but the air entrainment of outside air going in as well. The more volume he breathes in, the less his FiO2 will be. The less volume he breathes in, the more his FiO2 will be. But no matter how he's breathing, we cannot guarantee the FiO2 because it's a low flow device. Okay, we can't guarantee. We can only estimate what it's about, what it about what it will be. Okay, so that is the nasal cannula. Okay, so let's let's talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of the nasal cannula. <clears throat> nasal cannula, also known as prongs, the advantages: they're economical, comfortable. The patient can eat, talk, laugh, cough, etc. All right. The disadvantages is it's an imprecise FIO2. Can't guarantee it's FIO2. I can't guarantee it. Also, an obstructed nasal airway interferes with its O2 delivery. So what would what would that be? What could what could obstruct these nasal prongs from working? Like bugger, boogers, secretions. Right? If he gets a bunch of secretions caught up in this in this uh, nasal prong, he can't get his air, right? Huh? What you say? Okay. If you can't, if he has uh, mucus, if he has a buildup of mucus, guys, in this nasal prong, then he can't get his oxygen, right? If this is full of boogers, then that's going to obstruct the flow of the oxygen. So that could be a problem, right? That's that's one of the disadvantages. All right, but the patient can eat, he can talk, he can laugh, etc., while he's still getting his oxygen. Okay. Now, like we said, the disadvantages of that would be imprecise FiO2. That means we can't guarantee what his FiO2 will be. I can't document really what he's on. I can't get. I can't do for sure. I can only guess. Okay, now let's look at C. It can dry the nasal mucosal because medical oxygen is very, very dry. Oxygen, medical oxygen is extremely dry. So it can dry his nasal mucosal out. It can make his nasal uh, become uh, dry, cracked, bleeding, right? Anytime we have a patient on a nasal cannula, we want to consider putting a little humidification with it because it is very, very dry. Hold on one second, let me change my internet. Make sure I'm not on visitors. Let me see what that is going for. All right, switching over to the different Wi-Fi because it's acting up a little bit. Okay, here we go. All right. Do y'all see my screen? Yeah. All right. Now, it's very, very dry. Now, what are the flow ranges? We've been talking about the, um, res, uh, the regulator. We talked about the Thorpe tube and the flow meters. Now we're getting ready to get into the liters per minute. How do we know how many liters per minute to put on it? 
How much is that actually delivering, right? And how much can, or how many liters can a certain device put out? Well, the nasal cannula has flow ranges up to about six liters per minute. We can put them on 0.5 liters. We can put them on one liter, all the way up to about six liters per minute with a nasal cannula. After that, we, we need to move on to the next device, okay? It says that flows greater than six usually don't significantly increase the FiO2 due to a filled anatomic reservoir. After about six liters, you fill that reservoir up. You can't fill it up any more than that, okay? And so now we need to uh, add some more reservoir uh, to the system, and that would be something mechanical, which you'll see next, okay? So the nasal cannula is the first low flow device. It has advantages and disadvantages. It's economical. It means it's cheap, right? It's no, it doesn't cost a lot. It's more comfortable on them. They can eat and talk while they're getting, because if he had a mask on, it was time to eat. He couldn't eat, right? He had to take the oxygen off to eat, right? And when he takes the oxygen off, his oxygen is going to drop because some people, if they're on oxygen, they need it, okay? So you can't just take it off for a little while and, and do whatever, and well, we'll put that back on later on. You can't do it like that, okay? It's a drug, okay? And if they're on oxygen, they need it. So uh, it's comfortable. He can eat, he can talk, he can laugh with the oxygen in his nose. Uh, and like we said, it's very, very dry. That's one of the disadvantages, it's really dry. Uh, it's an imprecise FiO2, so we can't guarantee it. And it can be obstructed by boogers and mucus and nasal hairs or whatever else is up in your nose. The flow ranges for the nasal cannula is up to about six liters because flows greater than six, you can't hold any more up in your reservoir anyway, okay? That's the nasal cannula. Now, what about the FiO2 when it comes to those liters per minute? Oh, here we go. I told you, we cannot guarantee an FiO2, right? Cannot guarantee an FiO2. Pull yours, make sure you pull your mask back up because I'm away from y'all, so it's a little bit different. Uh, you cannot guarantee the FiO2, but we can guess, right? This is what we call the rule of four estimate. I can estimate how much oxygen he's on based on his breathing, regular breathing pattern. If he's breathing regular and he qualifies for a low flow device, now I can estimate how much oxygen he's getting or how much FiO2 he's getting. It's called the rule of fours. It's called the rule of fours. Now, oxygen in the atmosphere is 21%, right? but it's actually 20.95, okay? Oxygen in the atmosphere is actually 20.95%, but we round that to 21% for room air. But they go back to the 20.95 for the rule of four. And what it's saying is for every liter that you add of oxygen, you add four more percent FiO2, okay? So room air being about 20.95%, if I put them on one liter, they're now getting 24%. If I put them on two liters, now they're getting about 28%. If I bump it up to three liters, he's now getting about 32%. Four liters is about 36%. Five liters, about 40%. And six liters, about 44%. Right here. For every one liter of oxygen you put them on, you go up about 4% in FiO2. This is just an estimate. It's not guaranteed because it's a low flow device. Low flow devices, we cannot guarantee, but we can estimate, okay? So if I'm breathing in the regular atmosphere, I'm breathing about 20.95%, which is 21%, right? But they use the exact 20.95, okay? So if I put somebody, if I put this gentleman here on one liter, if I put an oxygen in his nose and I get him on one, if I put him on one liter, I'm gonna put this in his nose, put it back here where it stay. But this day I put him on one, uh, put him on oxygen in his nose, nasal cannula, right? If I put this man here on one liter, about what's his FiO2 on one liter? 0.24. 0.24 or 24%, okay? 0.24 is 
if, and that's on one leader, okay? So I'm gonna bump him up to, you're not gonna be able to see all this, but I'm just turning it up. I got him on, let's say I got him on two leaders. If I turn him on two liters, about what's his FO2 now? 28%. 28%, okay? What if I bump him up to three liters? Now we're about, 32. What, about 32%. And if I put him on four liters, he's getting about 36. 36%. Only if he's breathing a consistent, regular ventilatory pattern. None of that makes no difference if he start breathing crazy. If he start breathing real deep and real fast, then none of this, none of this works. Okay? None of this works. It only works if they qualify for a low flow device, right? And that's a person who's breathing a regular, consistent ventilatory pattern. So when somebody's oxygen a little low and they calm, you want to give them a little oxygen, then you can get, start with a nasal cannula. But we only want to give them enough to stop hypoxia, right? You don't have to joke straight down the throat with a um, uh, life support, right? I don't want to stick a tube down his throat just because his oxygen was a little low, right? Start low. You only want to give enough oxygen to stop hypoxia, okay? So depending on what you need. So if you got him on four liters and you look at his sat and he's 96%, then stop. That's enough. Stop right there. If you got him on four liters and uh, his oxygen is still 89%, then we need to go up a little higher, right? Up to about six when we're dealing with the nasal cannula, right? I had a question. Hold on. Oh. Okay. All right. Now, that is the nasal cannula. Now, if he is up to about six liters, five, six liters, and he's still not oxygenating well, then I don't go up to eight, nine, 10 liters, okay? It's time for me to switch to the next low flow device, which is the next step in the ladder, okay? For low flow systems, it's a ladder. You start at the bottom with a nasal cannula. The next step will be a simple oxygen mask. Let me show you that. Now that's the rule. Any questions on the rule of fours? No, not on the rule of four, but is a nasal cannula and a nasal catheter the same? No, they're not the same. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you all of the steps. Oh, okay. It depends on what they need. If they, you only give enough oxygen, right? Not the system. You only give enough oxygen to stop hypoxemia. Now, if he's hypoxic, but he's breathing a thousand times a minute, I can't start with a low flow device because he won't qualify. He has to have a high flow. And I can use a high flow at low FIO2s to, to beat the hypoxemia, right? But as far as which tool I use, depend on how he's breathing, okay? You can be hypoxic breathing slow or hypoxic breathing fast. It just depends on the need of the patient, okay? All right, yes, yeah, so the next, let's look at this. Here's the rule of fours again, showing you in your PowerPoint. One is about 24%. Now they go up to 10, but we don't do all the 10. We usually start right around six. Okay, you're not gonna see anybody in the hospital on 10 liters of nasal cannula. First of all, it's gonna dry them up so bad that they'll be bleeding, okay? Uh, okay. Now, the nasal catheter, now we will talk about, I did skip, I'm sorry. I, before I get to the, uh, high flow device, I mean, I'm sorry, the simple O2 mask, that is what I would do. But there are a couple in between that you don't hardly ever see, okay? And then these are this right here. The nasal catheter. The nasal catheter is similar FIO2s and indications as the cannula. It's just inserted different, okay? The nasal catheter is different than the nasal cannula in that you insert it a water-soluble lubricant just above the oral pharynx. So you will put it in his nose and open up his mouth and keep pushing it into his throat until you see it just below the uvula. All right, what's the uvula? The little dangly thing in the back of your throat. Good, good. the little dangly thing in the back of his throat, <laughs> his uvula. I don't, you can't see this man's uvula. But for this case, it wouldn't be a bi-nasal prone. It would be one 
one cannula. It'd be one catheter, right? It'd be like one little like this with some holes at the end, right? And I would put some KY gel, that's what we use in the hospital, some KY lubricant on the actual tube and take that tube and insert it into his nose, okay? I will push it, push it, push it into his nose until I see it drop down just below his uvula. When I see it, huh? Is that what they call the NG tube? No. The NG tube will go in the same way, but that's for nasal gastric contents. The okay. NG tube will go in the nose and all the way down to the stomach to get the stomach contents. The nasal gastric tube, that's what that is. But this goes in the same type of way, but it doesn't go away. The NG tube will go all the way into the mm -hmm. stomach. The, the nasal catheter just goes to, you see it drop below the uvula, that little piece of meat back there. As soon as you see that catheter drop below it, you pull back just enough to be level with the uvula and then tape it to his face. Very rarely will you ever see that in the hospital. First of all, it's, it's not comfortable. Uh, you know, it has to be changed. You're going to see it has to be changed every eight hours and all of that. So you, you wouldn't use that, okay? You, you don't use that in the hospital. But that's just another low flow device, okay? So the nasal catheter is uh, the next low flow device was still on kind of the same level as the cannula. It's not, a, it's not a step up, it's like a step to the side, okay? Uh, if you don't want it in the nose, the reason why we use that is because you can use less flow. Because if I already had it way down by the uvula, then I don't have to, I don't have to think about air going in training around the nose too much, right? Because the catheter is way back in the back of the throat. So I can use less flow to achieve a higher FIL2 like that. Very rarely do they ever use. This might be maybe somebody that doesn't have ears or something or some type of way, but, you know, it's old, something that they still talk about, but you don't see it anymore. Like I said, number four, rarely used. But you do need to know that the nasal catheter must be changed every what? Every eight hours and rotate the nares. So you pull it out of the left one, put it in the right one for eight hours. After that, pull it out of that one, put it in the, uh, the left one for eight hours. It has to be changed every eight hours. It can cause trauma by sticking and making you bleed because the nose is very, very highly vesselized, right? And they can bleed easy. So that's why we don't use it that much, okay? But as far as the NG tube, uh, Talisha, you would put the same way. They just keep pushing it mm -hmm. down. The thumb. You tell the patient to swallow. When it gets in his throat, say swallow so it don't go in his airway and it go into his stomach. And they just keep pushing till they get to the stomach and then they will put air in it and listen with the stethoscope in the stomach. And if I can hear air in the stomach when I push the tube, I know I'm in the stomach. Okay? That's how they do that. All right. Okay. Now, now we're going to the simple O2 mask. When the nasal cannula or the catheter is not enough, right? We had six liters, five liters. His oxygen is still a little low. Now it's time to go to a simple O2 mask. And all this really does is add more reservoir. Okay? The natural reservoir in a person is his oropharynx and his nasopharynx, right? Well, this is the old simple O2 mask. This is, see this right here? Now, not only do you have the oral and the nasal and oral pharyn uh, pharynx for reservoir space, but you got the mask. This mask itself is reservoir space. Oxygen is hanging around in here till you breathe it in, okay? Any little pocket where oxygen can hide is a reservoir, all right? And so this is a also known as a mechanical reservoir space, right? It's not, it's not anatomic, it's mechanical. And this is what it looks like. I'll go back so you can write the notes. This is a simple oxygen mask. Notice it's a mask, which is considered a reservoir space, right? When I put this on, not only do I have my anatomical reservoir space that's building up, but in between breaths, oxygen is building in the mechanical reservoir, right? It has little holes for me to exhale on the side, little ventilation holes here, okay? Because I don't want to build up what? CO2. So this is, um, this is a simple. All it is is a small bore tubing connected right to the mask. Simple O2 mask connected with, or also known as an aerosol mask, whatever. It's a mask connected to a small bore tubing this is a simple oxygen mask, okay? Simple oxygen mask goes on, Mr. Smith, just like this. Put it over his nose, 
behind his head. Yeah. Just don't worry about that part. You'll see that in a minute. Simple mask, simple oxygen mask. Go on just like that. I will plug this up to my oxygen source, which is my, my tank. All right. Now, there are some very important, uh, very important flow ranges to know about the simple O2 mask. Because the main thing is, I don't want to build up carbon dioxide. Okay, so the flow has to be adequate enough to get rid of the carbon dioxide. All right, so let's look at it. This is a simple O2 mask. The simple O2 mask can give you FO2 some about 35 to 55 percent, moderate concentrations, but depends on what. Depends on the story pattern. We still on low flow devices. This is still a low flow device. So I cannot guarantee the FO2. We can only estimate. <coughs> All right. What are the low, what are the flow ranges for the simple O2 mask? Five to eight. I'm flow throwing. Five to eight liters per minute. Five to eight liters per minute is what I use for simple O2 mask. The nasal cannula goes from about one to six liters. You see that they can, they, they overlap, okay? They overlap. I can go up to six on a nasal cannula, but I'd rather go on to the, nasal, to, the uh, to the simple O2 mask. If I gotta have six on a nasal cannula, it's time to move up to a simple O2 mask. Only reason is some people are very claustrophobic and they can't have anything on their face. Okay? I mean, nothing. Barely can do the nasal cannula, okay? so. That's why they overlap a bit. But very important that you have at least five liters on a simple O2 mask to, because if you have less than five liters, it will do what? You build up CO2. Build up CO2. Number three, less than five liters per minute may allow CO2 to build up, okay? Because when you exhale and that CO2 is in that reservoir, right? And if I don't have enough flow to blow that to flush that out, then now I'm rebreathing all of that CO2 and now my CO2 levels can start to build up. So with a simple O2 mask, the flow liters are five to eight liters, but must be at least five. Anything less than five, you're building up CO2. Also, it's less comfortable than a cannula. What can I do with a simple O2 mask than I could do with a cannula? You can't eat. I can't eat. What'd you say, Laura? Yeah, what I can't do, I can't eat, right? So if I'm time to eat, I gotta pull my mask off, right? So if I have this gentleman on a simple O2 mask and it's time to eat, I have to pull it down to eat. Every time I pull it down, he's losing oxygen because if he's on oxygen, he on it for a reason, he has to be on it. So he can't just take it off and say, oh, well, I'll put it back on when I get through eating. Some people with COPD guys can't even take two bites without catching their breath. It can get that bad that you have to catch your breath between bites with a fork. So I'll pick up a fork, eat a couple of bites, and now, whew, like I've been working out, just to eat a bite. You have destroyed your lungs that much from smoking, okay? It happens. And once you get to that point, you don't go back. Well, let me stop now. I feel way better. Damage that is done, that is pulmonary, is irreversible. Some of the symptoms can improve, but the most part, the damage is done, Okay. And so you get to the point where you can't even breathe in between bites, you know, what kind of life is that? Stop smoking, okay? <clears throat> now, so he's on oxygen, but when it's time to eat, he can't, he can't eat. So now, what do you recommend if he's on this and it's time to eat? What should I switch him to? The candle. The nasal nasal candle. I would do a nasal cannula, right? I would do a nasal cannula if he can tolerate just a nasal cannula, depending on how much he's on, right? All right, so let's continue to look at the simple O2 mask. It's less comfortable than a cannula. It says at six liters, it will deliver higher FO2 than it would a cannula at six liters because of that extra reservoir. See, the only difference between these two is the reservoir, right? 
you got the nasal cannula, you can use your anatomical reservoir. But with a simple O2 mask, you got your anatomical reservoir plus the mechanical reservoir, which is the mask itself. So I have more places for the oxygen to hide for a minute before I breathe it. All right. So they're saying at six liters on a nasal cannula, I get less of an FO2 than I would at six liters with a simple O2 mask, simply because it has more reservoir space. Okay. That is a simple O2 mask. This is what it looks like. It's just a mask with a small bore tube in it. If that ain't enough, now it's time to bump up to something a little higher. But we're still in the low flow devices, guys. We haven't gotten to any high flow devices yet. We're still in the low flow ladder. We started off with the nasal cannula, or if they want it, they use a nasal catheter, right? The next step is a simple O2 mask. And the next step is a partial or non rebreather mask. The name says what it is. The partial rebreather mask can give me FO2 up to 60%, depending on the patient's ventilatory pattern, okay? The flow range for a partial rebreather mask, which is the same for the non-rebreather mask, is eight to 10 liters per minute. See how we're going up on flow? Okay, now we can use eight to 10 liters on a uh, partial rebreather mask. And the, depending on what flow I put it on, it must be adequate enough to prevent the bag from collapsing on inspiration. Okay, I have to keep the bag from collapsing on inspiration. So let's get out the partial rebreather. And let's show you that. All right, let's finish talking about it first. <clears throat> Notice that on the partial rebreather, there is no valve between the bag and the mask. There's no valve, okay? So there is a, a no valve between the bag and the mask. The first one third of your exhaled gas goes down into the bag from your anatomical dead space. Therefore, similar to, similar to inspired gas. So if I exhale, my first third of my exhale goes down into the bag. So that means when I inhale, my, that, that same one third comes back to me. So I'm rebreathing some of my breath. That's why it's a partial rebreather mask. I partially rebreathe some of my exhale gas. Okay. Not to be used at low flow rates, because you might increase uh, to increase the patient's CO2. It's like, what if his CO2 is low and I want to increase it? Can I use it to end? No, never do that. Never use a bag or a mask to try to increase somebody's CO2. You'd be suffocating them. That's just like saying, I can let me choke you a little bit and I get your CO2 back up, right? That'll work, but you don't want to do that. All right. Partial rebreather mass, FO2 is up to 60%. However, it still depends on the ventilatory pattern. The flow range for a partial rebreather and non rebreather both are eight to 10 liters per minute. But if they are on 10 liters per minute, and that bag is collapsing on inspiration, I crank up the flow. It don't matter how much flow I put, I must have enough flow to prevent the bag from collapsing on inspiration, okay? Now, let's look at it closely. This is a partial rebreather mask as a small board tubing connected to a mask, right? With exhalation parts, and a reservoir bag, okay? This is a reservoir bag here. It also has no valve between the bag and the mask. See that? That's wide open. That's just a little gate there, but that's not a valve, okay? Between the, the mask and the bag, there is no valve, no flappy like a heart valve. There's no valve there, okay? When I exhale, my first third of my breath will go into the bag. And when I inhale, that first third will come right back to me. That's why it's called a partial 
rebreather. I'm partially rebreathing my own gas. Now, the trick about this is when I turn this on, that bag should inflate. And when a patient has the bag on his face, it should never deflate completely when they inspire. If he take a breath in and that bag is flat like this, I need to increase the flow. So when you have a question, you notice Mr. Smith is on a non-rebreather or a partial rebreather mask. And every time he inhales, the bag collapses. What should you do? The answer is increase the flow. Okay? So this is what it looks like. Fill it up to start it out. All right, this is that non rebreather mask. Now, if I take a really deep breath and try to collapse it, see that? If the patient is breathing like that and it's collapsing, you need to increase the flow. Okay, you need to increase, the, and if he keeps on doing it, we need to go to a high flow device, right? Because it depends on his ventilatory pattern. Now, if he's breathing and it's collapsing, I can increase the flow. If I increase the flow and it's still collapsing, it's time to move on to a high flow device, okay? He has graduated from low flow. Now we need to get into the high flow systems, okay? But this is still a low flow device called the partial rebreather mask. It has a mask and a bag reservoir, right? There is no valve between the mask and the bag. Now, when I say valve, I'm talking about a little valve like this, a little rubber valve that's usually in, that you're gonna find out that's on the non-rebreather mask, okay? And it will be here and on the sides, okay? And I'm gonna show you that next. Partial rebreather, the first one third of my breath goes into the bag and it does not have a valve between the mask and the bag. That'll, that is the, the uh, key points of the partial rebreather mask, okay? It can give you FIO2s up to about what? No, that's liters per minute. 40. 60, look, partial rebreather mask can give you FIO2 is up to about 60%, FIO2, right? And the flows are eight to 10 liters. Do not uh, mix up the flow for FIO2, guys. The flow is how fast you're pushing the oxygen in. The FIO2 is the oxygen itself. How much oxygen are they getting is the, is, is the FIO2. How fast are they getting it is the flow, okay? Those are two different things. So if I got a patient, on a partial rebreather, and every time he inhales his partial rebreather, that bag collapses. If that happens, you need to increase the flow, okay? It does not have a, it says no valve between the bag, the bag and the mask. No valve between the bag and the mask. That is the key points of the partial rebreather, all right? If this is not enough, then the last thing in our low flow device toolbox will be the non rebreather. This is the non rebreather. The non rebreather gives us FL tools from 70 to 100% is possible. Up to 100% with the non rebreather, but still depends on the patient's what? Ventilatory pattern. Ventilatory pattern. Depending on his ventilatory pattern, we can get up to 100% oxygen. Now, the flows are the same as the partial rebreather, 8 to 10. And, of course, we increase it if the bag is collapsing. But the most important difference in between the non-rebreather and the partial rebreather is that the non-rebreather has a one-way valve between the bag and the mask. 
and two one-way valves on the exhalation ports. So here we go. This is the non-rebreather mask. It looks just like the partial rebreather, except it has a one-way valve here. Let me see it. You can see that little valve, that rubber valve? See that? That is a one-way valve there. Okay, it's a little. You see that valve there? There's a one-way valve. There's a little piece of plastic right there. Okay, that is a one-way valve. That allows air or oxygen to look. It allows oxygen to come from the bag, but it will not let me push my air into the bag. Okay, that's the trick. When I exhale, my exhale gas goes out of the sides only. It does not go into the bag. That's why it's a non-rebreather. Because if I can't push my air in the bag, that means I'm not going to rebreathe my own air. So it's a non-rebreather. The only gas that patient is getting is the source gas. So whatever I got this hooked to, whether it be oxygen, heliox, or carbogen, or whatever I have it hooked to, that's all he gonna get, okay? That's all he's going to get. Now, the sides. These side pieces here are considered to be exhalation ports, okay? When I exhale, these little exhale, these little valves here are one-way valves. Okay, they stick on her just like that. See that? It's a valve. Okay, a little valve there. When I exhale, this valve will open up and let me exhale. But what about when I suck in? When I suck in, this is blocked. It can't get in, right? I can't get any outside air. So if I can't get outside air from out here, and I can only get the gas that's in this bag, then I'm getting 100% oxygen, okay? I'm getting 100% oxygen. I'm not pushing my air in, so it's not a non, it's not a partial rebreather. This is a non-rebreather because when I exhale, right? My exhale, my CO2 not goes in the bag, but comes out here, okay? When I inhale, I try to inhale this way, can't get it right? I can only get the gas that's coming from the bag, and this is all oxygen, okay? That is the difference between a non-rebreather and a partial rebreather. Now, you say, well, what about the other side, Mr. McCarthy? Yes, both sides, when you buy this new, it, it comes with one on both sides, but the manufacturer or the hospital will make sure you remove one. Why would I remove one? Think about what would be the reason why I would want to remove one. To prevent suffocation? Because just in case the bag's not working right or the oxygen is trapped or something. So what if my tube and my oxygen comes off the tank? The tank? You got Mr. Mr. Johnson on 100% non-rebreather, right? And then he hits his arm and he pulls it off the wall. So it's no longer getting oxygen from the wall, right? And now he has this on with two blocks right here. When he inhales, nothing's in the bag and he can't get nothing from outside, he's going to suffocate. So the only reason why we take one off is to prevent suffocation. But when you buy it in the store, it's on there. Okay? It's on there. So you have a one-way valve here. See this? This uh, Right here is a little, is a little valve here. I don't know you probably can't hardly see it, but that's a valve there. See that valve? That's the valve there that blocks your air from going in. You cannot breathe into this bag. Then you have two one-way valves on the exhalation ports, which one is usually moved for safety, okay? This is a non-rebreather mass. I can get FIO2s from about 70 to 100% FIO2 at flows of eight to 10 liters. So say Mr. Johnson is on this non-rebreather and he's inhaling and the bag is collapsing. What do I do? Increase the flow. Increase the flow. Increase the flow. Okay. That's it. That, that is the low flow devices. Start with a nasal cannula, right? Work our way up to a simple O2 mask. Then our partial rebreather, our non-rebreather, 
Uh, if that don't work, now it's time to pull out the bigger guns. Okay, now we need to get into what's called high flow devices. Okay, high flow devices. So let's look at it. The non repreather says one way valve between the bag and the mask has two one way valves on the exhalation port, but one is usually moved for safety. Now, this lab, I think, is in the module. The lab that I did on low flow and high flow devices is in the module. So as you study, you need to be watching these labs so you can see me hook it up because you're going to have to be able to have this stuff on the table. And I tell you, okay, show me a partial rebreather. You got to be able to get it. Show me a non rebreather. Show me a nasal cannula, right? Show me an aerosol face mask. Show me an aerosol T piece, aerosol trait collar, right? That's what we're getting ready to get into now. You have to be able to put that stuff together. Everything will be on the table for lab. And you got to be able to get it and put it together and turn it on right. Okay. You're going to have to be able to tell me the flow that's coming out of there. The total flow that's coming. What is the patient's demand, right? If they are not qualifying for a low flow oxygen device, then that means their inspiratory demand is really high. Okay. And when we switch somebody to a high flow device, we can now meet all of their inspiratory demands. I don't care if you breathe a thousand times a minute, I can meet it. Okay but I have to use a high flow device. And then you have to be able to tell me, okay, well, what is Mr. Johnson's demand? How do I know what his demand is? And how do I know if I'm meeting the demand with what I have set up, okay? That's what's coming up after break. All right, so let's take another 10 minute break. 2.55, come back in 3.05. 3.05, we will go into the next part of the lecture. Next part of the lecture, which will be, let's see what's coming up next. High flow systems. We're back. When I have a patient that does not qualify for a low flow device, now I need to go into a high flow device, okay? So as we think about what we've learned, we learned that uh, we give oxygen in order to treat three different things, either to treat hypoxemia, Decrease the work of the heart and decrease the work of what? Breathe. The lungs. And we also learned that once we decide to give oxygen, there will be some things we have to watch out for because there's some hazards involved. Uh, Michaelin told us that oxygen toxicity is the first hazard, which has to do with FIL2 and time, right? Greater than, I think, 50% over 24 hours can start to cause some oxygen toxicity. Make sure you know what the symptoms of oxygen toxicity are, what you learn. The next one was, um, I think it was absorption atelectasis. And that has to do with high FIO2, like 70%, and an obstruction. Okay, I told you in that video that we already learned that in the alveoli, the strong man or the strong force inside the alveoli is what gas? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Oxygen only exerts about 159 millimeters of mercury, right? Nitrogen is in the, what, 592, something like that? Very, very high, okay? So nitrogen is what keeps the alveoli walls open while the gas is exchanging. While oxygen and CO2 do their thing, they hold it open. Nitrogen holds it open, okay? And so when we have an obstruction and high FIO2s, then that alveoli will continue to absorb all of that oxygen and then eventually washing away the nitrogen. So absorption atelectasis is also known as nitrogen washout, okay? Once the nitrogen is gone, the alveoli does what? Collapses. Collapses. Collapses, because the nitrogen is holding it open. So if the nitrogen is gone, the alveoli falls below critical volume, right? Critical volume is the amount of volume that's in that alveoli enough to keep it open. Once it falls below critical volume, the alveoli collapses, okay? And that is absorption atelectasis. When those alveoli are closed, you got blood, but you don't have ventilation, it ends up being a shunt, okay? So the other thing would be uh, ROLF or ROP. So when we have uh, FIO2, not FIO2, but 
PaO2 is greater than 80 millimeters of mercury in a premature baby for too long, it will damage the retina, okay? The, the, it causes basal constriction in the retina, which will cause necrosis to those vessels, all right? Those vessels will not get the oxygen or the blood flow and die. Then the body, in a magic dash to try to stay alive, will make new vessels all of a sudden, but they make them so fast that they're so frail and they burst, and that causes blindness, okay? So we have to be very careful in that. So now, we know the hazards, we know the things that happen with, uh, with oxygenation, and then there's also another one called O2-induced hypoventilation. And that is for our COPD patients, right? You gave old Uncle Joe too much oxygen and you killed him, all right? His oxygen was around 90, 91%, right? On his finger probe, you got your new respiratory uh, in school and you went to see Uncle Joe and them and you went over there and said, let me test your, uh, your oxygen, Uncle Joe, with my new little uh, plus ox probe that they gave me in school. And, ooh, you 89%, uh, huh? right? He's fine. He's watching the game. Ain't thinking about you, right? And you end up bothering him. And now he 89, 91%. And you're like, oh, well, let me bump that, that, that concentrate. That's what makes your oxygen. I learned that that's where oxygen comes from. Let me cut that up for you. And you cut it up. You put it back on his finger. Now he 99%. I fixed you, Uncle Joe. Oh, okay, baby. He don't know. So he gone on about his business, right? So he watching the game, you bring him back some salami or whatever he asked you for a couple of hours later. Now he's not breathing fast. He's breathing very, very slow. He's hypoventilating because he's no longer hypoxic. Okay. He has to be hypoxic in order to breathe. Okay. And you have knocked out his hypoxic drive. You've taken what breathe, you've taken away what makes him breathe. Okay. So be careful. So now once we look through all of that, we decide we're going to give some oxygen, okay? Whatever the reason, this guy or this lady needs oxygen. So now I have to decide what device to put them on in order to uh, beat the hypoxemia. And we learned that if it's a low flow device, they need to be breathing consistent and regular, right? Respiratory rate around 25 or less. Now, if you see 26, that's okay, right? But that's that still qualifies. Um, and tidal volumes around 300 to 700. Okay, they qualify for a low flow system. So then when I look through my uh, toolbox for my low flow systems, I'm looking for my nasal cannula. I look for my, either my nasal catheter, uh, my simple O2 mask, my non rebreather, my partial rebreather, right? Those are the things I'm looking at in my low flow devices. But if that is not enough, and the patient now is not breathing consistent or regular, now it's time to go to my high flow device, okay? So in my high flow devices, I need to know a few things. It says the high flow system will meet all of the patient's demands for the, for the gas delivery. So if he's breathing 2,600 times a minute, I need to be able to meet that, okay? It's not always the oxygen that a patient needs. Sometimes it's the flow, all right? Sometimes they need to feel that flow. If you are in your car and you start feeling short of breath, what's the first thing you're going to do? If you're driving in the car, the windows are up, and you start feeling short of breath, what you going to do? Pull over. Let the window down. Let the window down. But what's the oxygen outside and what's the oxygen inside the car? 22%. It's the same. It's or 21%. 21%, it's the same. So you see that it's not just the oxygen. When you let your head hang out the window, it's because you want more flow, right? You need some more flow. I mean, cut the fan on, right? Even though that fan is blowing the same percentage as it was in there in the first place, okay? So outside your window is 21%. Inside your car is 21%. But sometimes they need that extra flow. Okay, and so that's what we call patient is being air hungry. Okay, when a patient is air hungry, you need to increase their flow. If you see he's struggling to get that breath, increase the flow. Okay, when you get to a machine or a ventilator or a BiPAP or a CPAP, 
increase the flow. That's what he's telling you he needs. Come on with that flow. You feed me too slow. Like a baby, a fat baby. You trying to give him little bitty bites at a time. He's looking at you like, come on with that. It's the same food, but you need to bring it a little quicker. Okay? And so that's what we have to know. Now, how do I know how much flow he needs? What if he can't talk? There's a formula for that, right? To find out what is his flow. Now, B says a totem system output must be at least three times the patient's minute ventilation. All right, so that is his demand. So everybody look up here. The demand for the patient, the patient's demand is three times minute ventilation. I need to be able to provide at least three times his minute ventilation. Okay, I got to be able to do that. So you have to know the ventilation, right? It doesn't go away. So let's look at it. If I know that I need to give three times the patient's minute ventilation, that is his demand. All right, that is his demand. So I'm gonna write right here. Just for example, Mr. Smith has a respiratory rate of 32 and a tidal volume of 600. What is his demand in liters? What is his demand? Let's work on that. If you know that demand is three times the top, the minute ventilation, three times minute ventilation is demand. Well, his respiratory rate is 32. His tidal volume is 600. What is his, I'm not asking for his minute ventilation. I want to know his demand. I have to know what that is first to decide whether I can meet it or exceed it. So put it in the chat when you got it and I'll look up myself. Yeah, answers here. Good, Michael, and good, Stephanie. Good charisma. I phone you close. You're off a little bit, though. You're close, but you're not there. Whoever that is. Whoever put 50, you're close. You're not there. Yep, Brittany, I'll let you do it when the class is over. What is his demand? With this respiratory rate and this tidal volume, he's telling you how much you need to be able to give to him. Otherwise, you need to get out of the way. Brittany, good. Change it into a... Uh, Leaders, though, Brittany, you got middle leaders, but that's good. And I know you're on the right track. There you go. Good, Heather. Good, whoever the other iPhone. Oh, Kenya. Kenya, good, Kenya. That's close enough. What you got, Shatara? What you got, Laura? What you got? Okay, that's close enough. All right, so if you got 57 point something or 56, that's it, all right? This is how you do it. Three times the patient's minute ventilation. That's why you cannot forget your formulas. Minute ventilation ain't going nowhere. Remember, minute ventilation is simply minute Ventilation is frequency times tidal volume. The frequency in this case was what? 32? 32 times 0.600 or 0.6, or if you did 600, it came out in milliliters, but to make it liters, 32 times 0.6 is 57, let's just say 57 liters per minute. So his demand, wait, wait, wait. 
I'm sorry. I skipped a step. I skipped a step. Let me, uh, what is the minute ventilation? 19. Yeah. All right, so the minute ventilation, I'm sorry, I skipped a step. The minute ventilation is 19 point what? So 19 point what? Point two liters is the minute ventilation, right? And they said demand is three times this. So 19.2 times three is what? So demand is about 57 liters per minute. That's his demand. That's how much I have to be able to accomplish. I gotta be able to give him that if he's, cause that's what he's, he's hungry. He wants that. He's telling you, man, I need 57. I need almost 60 liters per minute coming my way, right? That's how much I need. If you're only bringing me 20, you're in my way, okay? You're not bringing me what I need. You're not meeting or exceeding. So that's the question. Once I find out the patient's demand, guys, the next question is, see, look at the questions. Question says, what is my patient's demand? That's the first question. Second question. What is the total flow of my device? Okay, we're gonna learn that one. Third question is, am I meeting or exceeding his demand with my device? Okay, so the next thing you're gonna learn is how do I tell you how much he's getting from the device that I'm, I'm using? Okay, which is a high flow system. I'm gonna show you the math part, then I'm gonna show you the devices and how they work, okay? So, in order to find the total flow of my device, I have to use what's called the magic box. Magic box. This magic box can be found in your module. There's a form I put in there that says magic box. It tells you exactly how to do it. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a device. You're going to figure out the total flow of that device. I'm going to give you a patient. You tell me his demand. And then you tell me, are we meeting? Or are we not? Okay. Are we meeting or exceeding? That's the question. Am I meeting or exceeding? It's okay to go over. You just don't want to go under. If he needs 57, then you need to be given at least, at least 57 or more. If you're giving 80, that's fine, right? But if you're giving 55, you ain't giving enough, okay? All right, so let's look at it. In order to do the magic box, you have to put the FIO2 that the patient is on in the middle, right? And then you're gonna find the air to oxygen ratio. Remember, we talk about the air and the oxygen mixing together, right? To make a total flow. If I have some oxygen in, and I add some outside air in, they mix together and they're gonna give me one total flow, okay? This is how you find that. Do I wanna cover this yet? Magic box. Okay, let's just do it like this from here. For instance, this will be a sample high flow device that you might be on. I'm gonna write it right here. This is a sample high flow device. Mr. Johnson is on a 40% aerosol trait collar, which is ATC, 40% aerosol trait collar, running at 12 liters per minute. This is the, the high flow device that you got him on, right? And I'm gonna show you that. Well, let me show you the math first, and then I'll go to the device. I want to go back and forth. Show you the math first, and then I'll show you what that looks like, what that type of device is, and you can learn all of that. Okay. Aerosol trait collar. This is just an example right now, okay? He's on 40% aerosol trait collar, running at 12 liters per minute. That means the, the flow you have on the, on the, the flow meter is at 12 liters per minute, 
and you have him on a high flow setup called an aerosol tray collar. Okay. And like I said, I'll show you on this mannequin once we do a couple and you understand the math. Then I'll show you the device. This is what he's on. I need to know whether this is meeting or exceeding his demand. Okay, so let me write it over here so I can have more space to, to play with. All right. I have him on a 40% aerosol trach collar running at, what I say? 12. 12. 12 liters per minute. That is what he's on. That's the oxygen device that I have him on. That's what he's on, okay? That's what I have him on. So I have to find out, if I'm meeting and exceeding his demand, I need to know what the total flow of this is. My question is, what is the total flow of this device? What is the total flow? In order to find total flow, we use the magic box. There's the magic box. When I do the magic box, guys, I'm first gonna find the air to oxygen ratio. What is the mixture with the flow and the oxygen? What is the air to oxygen? You got, you got parts. You know how you say, uh, if you're gonna make a solution is two parts bleach and three parts water or whatever. Well, this is the same way. It's oxygen and air. You're gonna have a certain amount of parts oxygen, you're gonna have a certain amount of parts air, okay? Now, remember that the oxygen part is always one, okay? It's always gonna be one, but let's get to that. What goes in the middle of the box? FIO2. What's the FIO2 of that device? 40%. So 40 goes here. You always put 100 right here and 20 right here. Now. 100 minus 40 is what? 60. 60 goes right here. 40 minus 20 is what? 20. 60 divided by 20 is what? 3. 3. So my air to oxygen ratio is three parts air to what part oxygen? No. One. One, it's always one. Oxygen parts is always one. So my air to oxygen ratio is three to one with that device. 40% is always gonna be three to one. The air to oxygen ratio of 40% is three to one. See, all we're trying to find out right now is the air to oxygen ratio of the FIO2. He's on 40%. So 40% will always be three to one. You can memorize that or you can do the magic box because it's in the book listed 28%, 30%, 35%, 40%. It's got them right, the ratios right beside it. You can memorize it or you can learn how to do it. Okay. But 40% is always three to one, always. Okay. All right. So that's 40%. What you did, first thing you did was put the FIO2 in the middle and then you subtracted. 100 minus 40 gave you 60. 40 minus 20 give you 20. 60 divided by 20 is three. So air to oxygen ratio is three to one, okay? So that's the first thing you do is get the air to oxygen ratio. Three parts air to one part oxygen. So the next thing I need to do is find the total parts. So if I got three parts air, one part oxygen, what's the total parts? 
Four. Huh? Four. Four. Okay? So this is the air to oxygen ratio. The next thing is, so this is one. The next thing is total parts. Well, I have three parts air, one part oxygen. So I have a total part, total parts of what? Four. Four total parts. Last part, I want to know the total flow. That's the question. Total flow, I have to do this. That's number three. Three is total flow. Total flow is the total parts, total parts times the liters per minute. That's going to give me my total flow. So what's the total parts? 48. Four. What's the total parts? Oh, four. Four. And four times? 12. 12 liters per minute is what? 48. Good. So my total flow, total flow of this device is 48 liters per minute. That's how much flow that this 40% aerosol tray collar running at 12 liters per minute is putting out 48 liters per minute of total flow. Now, am I meeting the last man's demand? What was his demand? What was his demand? The last patient, Mr. Smith. What 40, I say? 40, 40%. 40. Listen to me, guys. I said his demand. No, we're not meeting Thank it. You. Yeah. He demanded 57 liters per minute. Remember that? He said, I got to have 57 or you can go find somebody else to play with, right? So he said he need 57. The device that we're given is only given 48. So are we meeting his demand? No. No. So in order to meet his demand, what has to happen? All right. We're going to have to increase the total flow by decreasing the FiO2. Because remember, what happens? We say we increase the flow. What happens to FiO2? Decrease. If I increase that FiO2, what's going to happen to the flow? Decrease. It's going to decrease, right? So if I need to get more flow, I got to come down on the FiO2. All right, so let's remember that. Let's see if that works, if, if that's right. Good job. So this is giving a total flow of 48, a 40% aerosol tray collar at 12 liters is 48 total flow. All right. So let's, let's, let's change it up and Decrease the FiO2 and see if we can get more flow. All right. Now I'm going to change that to 28% aerosol tray collar at 12 liters per minute. Now remember, I'm going to write it over here. His demand was 57 liters per minute. That is what he's asking for. All right. Now let's see what now our total flow is at 28%. Aerosol tray collar still running at 12 liters per minute. All right, so let's do our magic box. What goes in the middle? 28, right? 120. 100 minus 28 is what? 72. 20 minus 28 is what? 8. 8. 72 divided by 8 is? Nine. Nine. So nine parts air <laughs> and one part O2. All right? So the the air to oxygen ratio for 28% is nine to one, always. <laughs> All right. So now mute your mics. Mute your mics. The total parts, don't skip ahead. Total parts. Right? We have nine parts air, one part oxygen. So the total parts is what? 10. 10 total parts. So we got 10 parts. Now, what is the total flow, which is the parts times? Parts times liters per minute. Yeah, so the parts times liters per minute gives us a total flow of what? How much? 120. 100 
and 20 liters per minute. Now, now are we meeting in demand? Yes. Yes. Are meeting and exceeding in demand. So you see how if you decrease the FO2, you're going to increase the total flow. Okay. It's like you said, if you're breathing and I start taking a really deep breath, my FO2 is going to go down because I increased the flow. More flow gives me left FO2. If I want more FO2, I have to decrease the flow and not in training so much. So I'm not bleeding it down so much. So if I went up to like 60% aerosol tray collar, then that total flow would have went even farther down. Okay, let's look at another device. Good job. I'm gonna give you a patient and I'm gonna give you a device. Huh? Uh-uh, I'm gonna give you a patient information and I'm gonna give you a device. And I'm gonna make you think this time. Mr. Smith, is 88 kilograms and his tidal volume is 580 ml. What is his demand? Okay, and then so that's him. Over here, you have him on a uh, 30, for starting to say, 35% uh, aerosol face mask running at 10 liters per minute. First question is, what is his demand? The second question is, what is the total flow? And the third question is, are we meeting? Are we meeting his demand? Meeting demand? Yes or no? Work on that. Mr. Smith is 88 kilograms and he has a tidal volume of, oh, not, wait a minute, I forgot to add. Um, I, tricked my, I tricked myself up. Hold on. I know you're writing, but too bad. 88 kilograms with a respiratory rate of. 18. Do that. My bad. Because I need you to figure out his title volume. So Mr. Smith is 88 kilograms at a respiratory rate of 18. What is his demand? What is the total flow of that 35% aerosol face mask running at 10 liters per minute? And are you meeting his demand? Yes or no? And you know how to put it all in the chat. I'm just going to give y'all some time. Then I'll ask a couple people and then we'll do it because it'd be too many different answers.
Y'all ready? All right, Shatara. Uh, what is the patient's demand? His demand. You got what? Oh, okay. Uh -uh. What you get for demand, Lori? Mm -hmm. Michael, and what you get for demand? I got 10.4 liters. Okay, maybe I did it wrong. All right, anybody get anything different for demand? I got something different, I guess, because I converted 88 kilograms to 2.2 .2 times 18. Yeah, yeah, that's what I did. That's what I did. I got three, 348.4. Oh. We moved right. And I got three and... 325. Okay. So the man is 31.5. Thank you. That's what I got. 31.3. Look at it. Look at it. We got to do minute ventilation, guys. It's frequency times what? Tidal volume. Tidal volume. I don't know his tidal volume. So I got to figure it out. He's 88 kilograms. Remember, tidal volume. Is three times three cc's per pound. Three cc's per pound. Okay, that's the title volume. That's why you got to know this stuff. Now, so now we need to find out how many pounds he is. Well, 88 kilograms times 2.2 is 193.6 pounds. 193.6 pounds. So this right here is okay. I see what I missed. 193.6 pounds. I take that times three. Multiply by three. And I get 5.5 pounds. Okay. Now let's go to the next one. Okay. I forgot that step. Yeah, I know. That's why I throw it in there. You got to know that stuff, guys, because you may get a question and it's going to make you rely on what you've learned. You got to know tidal volume. You got to know how to get uh, minute ventilation. You got to know how to get alveolar minute ventilation, right? They may say, they may want to know the uh, alveolar air equation. You got to know how to get that stuff. It ain't going nowhere, okay? It's not going to always be cut and dry, okay? That's all right. So he's 580 cc's is his tidal volume so with 580 cc's as his tidal volume now i can find out what his demand is well 580 so 0.580 times his respiratory rate of 18 gives me 31 about 31 liters per minute is his demand 31 liters per minute. That's why I told you, I knew it was going to trick you a little bit. That's why I'm going to make you think on this one. All right. Now that we know his demand is 31, 31 liters per minute, that's his demand. Now, let's find out what the total flow of this device is. All right. Uh, what goes in the middle? 31. Huh? 35. 35. 35. So we got 100 right here and a 20 right here. 100 minus 35 is? 65. 65. 35 minus 20? 15. 15. So 65 divided by 15 is what? 4 point something. 4.33. It's called 4.333. So you just do 4.3. 4.3 parts air, and how many parts O2? One. One. So 4.3 parts air, one part oxygen gives me a total parts of? One, I mean 5.3. Thank you. 4.3 plus one is 5.3. 5.3 total parts. And then my total flow is 5.3 times 10. 10 liters per minute. So what is it? 53 liters per minute. So my total flow is 53 liters per minute. 
So am I meeting his demand? Yes or no? Yes. There you go. All right, one more, and then we're going on to the uh, the actual devices so I can show you how, how they are, what they look like. What I'm talking about. This right here is a high flow device. I'm gonna show you how it's made. Okay. All right, good job. Let's do another. All right, this time. Mr. Smith is, let's say he is two hundred pounds and has a respiratory rate of thirty two. Okay. I need to know what his demand is and, and his demand. Now, this is what he's on. You have him on a 60% aerosol face tint running at 18 liters per minute. Mr. Smith. Is 200 pounds and he has a respiratory rate of 32. He's on 60% aerosol face tint running at 18 liters per minute. What is his demand? What is his total flow? And are you meeting his demand? We're going to do this one, then we're going to take a break, come back and complete the uh, lesson. Let me pause while y'all work on that. All right, guys, this is the answers right here. Mr. Smith's demand is 57.6. The total flow of this device is 36 liters, and we are not meeting his demand. All right, he is 200 pounds at a respiratory rate of 32. So to find the tidal volume, of course, is three times, uh, three pound, three times one every cc, right? So if he's 200 pounds times three is 600. 600 times 32 gives us a minute ventilation of about 19.2. You do that times three and you get 50, yeah, 57.6, okay? All right, total flow. He's on a 60% aerosol face tent. 60% in here, 100 here, 20 here. 100 minus 60 is 40. 60 minus 20 is 40, right? So we are at a 40 divided by 40 is what? One. So one part air and one part FO2. So remember, if you want to memorize, 60% is always one to one, okay? 40% is always three to one. Right, you can you'll know them as you see them, but this is the way to find out. If you don't know, this is how you figure. It. So we have one part air, one part O2. So this is a total parts of two, two total parts. So total parts times the leak times the flow, right, is two times eighteen, which gives us thirty six. The total flow of this device. Is 36 liters per minute. He would say he got to have 57. We only giving him 36. So we are not meeting his demand. All right. That is how you find total flow and demand. Okay. Now we're going to take a break. And when we come back from break, we're going to show you these devices. I'm going to show you a 60% aerosol face tent or aerosol PPs or whatever. It's not as hard as you think. It's all about what's on the end. Whatever's on the end, that's what you call it. Whether it's a tray collar, an aerosol mask, a face tin, a tea piece, whatever's on the end is what you call it, okay? All right, 
Let's take a break. It is 355. Let's come back at 410. Take a 15 minute break. Come back at 410 and we're going to get on into the lesson. Good job. Was anybody on here didn't get what we just did or don't know how you got it? Don't know how we yeah, got it. I got it. I missed that times three uh 200 with the 200 pound. That was my mess up. But you understand what you did? I did. Okay. Does anybody not understand at all what we just did? I don't understand. Who was that? Brittany. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't I feel so lost. If I'm being honest, I, I'm so confused. Okay. What part of you don't get you don't understand? What part are you not missing? What I mean, what part are you missing? The the demand part or the total flow part? The beginning with 200 pounds, like well, I gotta convert it. Okay. Remember that to find, I don't know if you were watching earlier, but to find the demand, the demand is three times minute ventilation. That is the that is how I find the demand. It has to be the three times the minute ventilation. And you got to remember, so here it is right here. To find the patient's demand, it is three times minute ventilation. And you got to remember that minute ventilation is frequency times tidal volume, right? And so in order to find the minute ventilation, we got to know the frequency and the tidal volume. Once we find the minute ventilation, we multiply that by three, and that's the patient's demand, okay? And so the reason why I threw some of those in there because they didn't give you the title volume. You had to figure out the title volume with an older uh, formula, which is three cc's per pound, okay? So let me write it down. Remember that... To find a patient's minute ventilation, minute ventilation, right? It's frequency times the tidal volume. That's one we had earlier. Okay, you got that? You remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Heather, you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, in order to find the patient's demand, it is three times the minute ventilation. So whatever the minute ventilation is, I multiply by three and that's going to be his demand. So it'll be 600 since it was three times 200. Yeah, well, hold on. Yeah, yeah. But let me get to that point. So, uh, so yeah. So to find the demand is simply three times minute ventilation. Now, if I don't give you the title volume and you still got to find minute ventilation, but not give you a weight, then you have to use the weight to find the title volume. Remember? So if you don't know the tidal volume, remember that the tidal volume is three cc's per pound. Three cc's per pound is how you find tidal volume. So looking at this, Heather, what will be the tidal volume if somebody is 200 pounds? What will be the tidal volume if somebody's 200 pounds, if it's three cc's for every pound? 600. So the tidal volume would be 600. Okay. And what if I said, Heather, that his fee weighs 80 kilograms? What will be the tidal volume for somebody who weighs 80 kilograms? Remember, you got to convert kilograms into pounds and then multiply it by three. Do you remember the formula for kilograms to pounds, uh, Heather? For every pound is 2.2. Yeah, 2.2. So to convert from kilograms to pounds, you have to multiply. Multiply by 2.2. .2. 
So Heather, how many pounds is 80 kilograms, Heather? First, you tell me the pounds. How many pounds is 80 kilograms, Heather? 176. 176. So 80 kilograms is 176 pounds. Well, if that's true, then what would this patient's tidal volume be, Heather? If he's 176 pounds, then what would his tidal volume be, Heather? Like 528.9, it's supposed to be 176.3. Okay, well 176 times three, 528, you said 528? Yes, sir. Okay, so 528 cc, that will be his tidal volume, okay? So it's just steps, that's all. Just make sure you go back and know how to get to what you're looking for. But the bottom line is to find the patient's demand, you have to have three times his minute ventilation. To find his minute ventilation, it is frequency times tidal volume, okay? Now I can give you the tidal volume or I might not give you the tidal volume. The, the, the question may or may not. Okay, so for instance, let's do an easy one. In this, in this situation, what would be the uh, demand of a patient who is respiratory rate of 12 and a tidal volume of 500? <clears throat> uh, Heather, what will be the minute ventilation of that? Sixty. Say what now? Is it sixty? The minute, the minute ventilation. Yeah. You do, yeah, you do point, point five hundred times twelve. What does that give you? Remember, when we multiply that, multiply, multiply that tidal volume, you do it as a decimal. So 0. 0.500 times 12 gives him how many liters? Six. I put the decimal on the on the on the respiratory rate, not the. Oh, yeah, don't, don't do that. Put the respiratory the decimal on the tidal volume. So that is a minute ventilation of six liters. Okay. So if he's breathing 12 times a minute at 500 tidal volume, his minute ventilation is six liters. So if his minute ventilation is six liters, then what is his demand, Heather? Six times three. 18. 18. So his demand will be 18 liters per minute. That's how you find demand. Demand is three times the minute ventilation. Okay, can, can you explain the, the box? Okay, no problem. <clears throat> All right, so now that we know how to find demand, you may get the volume, you might not. If you don't get the volume, you have to find the volume by the weight, okay? And the weight might be either in pounds or it might be in kilograms. So it's just a step thing. All right, now, but once we say we know <clears throat> the demand, right? We know how to get demand. Well, a magic box is simply finding the air to oxygen ratio of a given FiO2, okay? When you want to find out the air to oxygen ratio of any given FiO2, you just put the FiO2 in the middle. That's what you do. So for this problem, this is the device that I have him on. I put the patient on a 60% aerosol face tent that's running at 18 liters per minute. <clears throat> so inside the box, Heather, what do I put inside the box? It's 60. You just subtract 60. I mean, 100 minus 60 is what? Goes this way. 40. And then it goes this way. Okay, 40 up here divided by 60 minus 20 is what, Heather? 40. 40. So 40 divided by 40 is what, Heather? One. One part air. And it's always one part oxygen. The oxygen part is always one, no matter what. So one to one is the air to oxygen ratio of 60%. Did 
the air to oxygen ratio, air to O2 ratio is one to one because 600 minus 60 is 40, 60 minus 20 is 40, 40 divided by 40 is one. One part air, one part oxygen, okay? Now, that gives us the air to oxygen ratio. The next step would be to find the total parts. So Heather, if we have one part air and one part oxygen, then how many total parts do we have? Two. Two. Two total parts, okay? The last step is to say, how, what is the total flow? To find the total flow, you multiply the total parts times the liters per minute, and that gives us total flow. So total flow equals total parts times liters per minute. What is the total parts again, Heather? Two. Two times, what's the liters per minute? 18. 18. So two times 18 is what? 36. So the total flow is 36 liters per minute. That's how much flow is coming out of my device. And then when you look at that, you say, well, is he, is that enough for him or not enough, right? That's either meeting or exceeding his demand. I forgot what his, the demand was on the last patient, but you have to look at what his demand is. <clears throat> so just to say, for instance, just, for, just for, for instance, Heather, if I'm giving out 36 liters per minute in my device, what if his demand is 52 liters? Am I meeting his demand? No. No. What if his demand is 40 liters? Am I meeting his demand with this? No. No. What if his demand is 25 liters? Am I meeting his demand with this? Yes. Yes. That's how you do it. That, yeah, thank you. That, okay. I mean, it makes no more sense. Thank you. No problem. Now, this sheet right here is in your module that says magic box, and it explains how you break down the magic box and how you do it. So it's in the module, and you can go back and look at this video, and you're going you're gonna to get it. It's, it just sometimes it takes a couple of times to look at it. It ain't nothing to it. Nothing to it. Couple more minutes and we'll come back. Okay, that that guys is um, we're back from break and that is a uh, how you find demand and also how do you find uh, the total flow of your device. Okay, so now we're in the high flow systems. You're gonna learn that it looks a little bit different. High flow is a little bit different. Uh, and now let's talk about the indications for a low flow device, right? Who qualifies for a low flow device? Let me bring him over in here. You ain't getting on this check though, so you know. All right, let's look at it. The high flow system, normal peak flow, they say are about three times a person's minute ventilation. So that's what he needs. Just like I said, if you are short of breath in your car and you're riding down the street, you're going to stick your head out the window, okay? Same FIO2, but it's giving you more flow, okay? You need, some people need flow. The criteria, the criteria for a person who wants to need the high flow system is the one who doesn't meet the one for the low flow system. It's real simple, okay? That means their tidal volume is not 300 to 700. The respiratory rate is greater than 25 and it's an irregular or inconsistent ventilatory pattern. So if he's breathing real hard and deep or just barely breathing. Now, please don't misunderstand that just because he's breathing really, really shallow does not mean he needs a low flow, right? It needs to be between 300 and 700 for low flow. If it's not, you need a high flow, okay? So if somebody is, for whatever reason, uh, respiratory depressed, 
uh, overdosed or something like that, and they're breathing real shallow, you don't want to give them a low flow device because that's going to give them too much FO2 because it's all that reservoir just building up. He's only breathing three times a minute. So when he does inhale, all of that built up oxygen is going in and that may harm him, okay, or her. So you want to, the reason why we want to give a high flow device is because we can guarantee the FIO2. Whether you breathe one time a minute or a million times a minute, you will get a definite FIO2, okay? So the people who qualify for the high flow system are the ones that don't qualify for the low flow system. Okay? If you sitting around looking like this man here or like this man right here, you don't need a cannula. You need a high flow system. All right, so the first high flow system we're gonna talk about is the Venturi mask. A Venturi mask is a high flow, but normally low concentrations. Like you asked me earlier, uh, do you have to be on a low flow for low oxygen? It doesn't matter, okay? You can give low concentrations or high concentrations with a, low, a high flow device. It's even better because I can guarantee what you're gonna get, okay? So if I'm not sure if you are impending respiratory failure or if you're a COPD or we already said we want them to have a precise FO2 because we don't want them to breathe too much but a normal COPD patients are on a cannula okay uh, because they're as long as they're not having an exacerbation or a flare-up right as long as they're not having a flare-up then they're okay they're breathing consistent just like we are all right uh, but somebody who I'm not sure he's looking like he's getting ready to either slow down or he's breathing really hard. I'm just going with a high flow system just to be on the safe side. Okay. So a Venturi mask can give us uh, FIO2s from about 24% up to 50%. Okay. And this is a very important principle that you need to know. This is where the air entrainment comes from. When I say that word air entrainment, like the fart, you let the windows down and it sucks in all that outside air. That's called air entrainment, E-N-T-R-A-I, something, you know, I'm not a speller. Entrainment, figure it out. So when I pull in air from outside, I'm pulling in outside room air, right? 21%. And that will decrease the FIO2 that I have, right? Now, it would decrease the FIO2, but it increases the total flow, right? I let the window down, the total flow inside my car, like, damn, let the window, right? It's a lot of flow even though the percentage of fart is almost gone, okay? So if I increase the flow, I'm going to decrease the FIO2, okay? If I decrease the flow, I'm going to increase the FIO2. Don't forget that, all right? So what is the Venturi principle, okay? The Venturi principle is that principle of air entrainment. It's based on the Bernoulli principle, which is when a gas passes through a restriction, radial pressure decreases and velocity increases, okay? The Venturi part of it says a pre-restriction pressure returns to normal uh, if input doesn't deviate more than 15 degrees. You don't have to remember that part. I'm about to show you what Venturi is, okay? The Venturi is a principle that sets up a specific air entrainment ratio. That's that air to oxygen ratio. The air to oxygen ratio is the, also known as the entrainment ratio. You got certain amount of parts air and certain amount of parts oxygen, okay? Remember, 40% oxygen is a ratio of three to one, right? It is. If you don't remember that, then you can just do the magic box and figure it out, okay? Uh, they all have their own ratio, okay? So let me show you, uh, this is just a picture of them here, but let me show you uh, an example of Venturi. This is a Venturi type device here. Notice how it has a little arrow there. What is that arrow saying the percentage is? 98, what about that right there? What about that? What about that? Yeah, okay, and what about this right here? 28, right? Notice how the lower the FIO2 got, the bigger these windows got. See these windows? Right? This is the wind air entrainment window right here. The bigger the window, the more outside air is being sucked in, so the less FIO2 you're going to have, right? 
Watch when I go to 98% F out too. See how the window getting smaller? 40, 60, 80, 98%. Look at the windows now. Damn near closed, right? So that means if I'm hooked to oxygen, if I have this hooked to oxygen, I hook it up just like this. This is how I hook the first part of it up, okay? Just like that, right on to the flow meter. If I turn this on, what percentage of oxygen is coming out if these windows are completely closed? If these, if I'm not pulling in no outside air, then what oxygen is actually coming out of here? 21%. 100%. And I don't know if you can see it, you can barely see it. Can you see the, the, the aerosol? You see the aerosol? See that aerosol coming out of there? Because there's water in there, okay? The main reason is because when we start dealing with high flow systems, we need humidification because most people who use a high flow system have a bypassed upper airway. Remember the nose does this, what it's doing? That's what the nose is supposed to do. But just think if I have, uh, Mr. Johnson has a trait, right? Like this, this gentleman over here has. There is no nose right here, right? So the air that's going in here is pure dry. And we said that medical oxygen is extremely dry. So if I don't put some water on it, it's going to uh, dry him out, right? So you think of yourself, make a joke, say, put some water on that chip, right? Put some water on that, right? Just like I said, I put that on everything. I put that... Okay, put water on everything. If you're blocking that air, if you're bypassing the upper airway, you need to put some water on that. Okay, most definitely. Okay, now, so if I have this, now notice how you see it coming out, right? You can see the flow coming out pretty good. But what happens when I open these windows? I'm going to start pulling in more outside air when I open up this Venturi window, right? That's going to make the FL2 go down, but the total flow coming out is going to go up. Because I'm sucking in from outside. So then you won't see the mist as good. It's still coming, but it's coming so fast, you're not going to see it. Okay, so let's look at it. I made a little mess over here. Yeah. All right, I got to get me a better camera situation. All right, so now if you look at it, it's on 98%, right? Now I'm going to open this window up. You can hear it get louder. Hear that? Now I'm at 28%. Can you see the mist now? You barely can see it. You can hear it coming out a lot more now, right? That flow has increased. I got a hell of flow, but the FO2 is low now, right? FO2 is only 28%. But the total flow is coming out pretty good. Okay? So let's go to, let's try 35. Just listen, listen as it gets lower. 40. Sixty, eighty, ninety-eight. 80, 98. See that? Now I'm getting a whole lot of FO2, but just barely some flow. Okay? And we can figure that out by using the magic box. If I ask you what the total flow of this was right now, you'd be able to tell me. You'd be able to tell me he's on 98% aerosol trade collar running at... What's up there on the flow meter? 10 liters per minute. About 10 liters per minute, yeah. So 98% aerosol trait collar at 10 liters per minute. What would be the total flow? Right? You could figure that out by using the magic box. Okay? That's how you do that. So that is the first part of our high flow system. Right? The Venturi system. Now, this will be called an aerosol something, 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 right? Whatever is on the end is what I call it. But because it's water, it's aerosol, okay? Now, Venturi can be either aerosolized or just regular. 
Okay. The first one we're going to talk about is just regular. Okay. So let me cut this back off. And let's talk about the Venturi setup. The regular, this is regular Venturi. They come in different shapes and sizes. This is also considered a Venturi setup. Look at this one. See the numbers right there? See that says 35% right there? Yes, sir. 35, 40, 50, 60, 80, and then 95. Now the holes on this one is at the top. So look. 95% FL2, how much air in train? Look, this hole and this is almost closed, right? Pretty much closed. There's no, no, not much room for anything to come through, right? But if I change this from 98% to let's say 28%, I'm gonna open it up to 35. Okay, so look, let's put it on 35%. There it is right here. 35%, okay, so let's see. 35, which is a low FL2. Now I'll look at the windows. See how open they are? See that? I'm looking almost right, right down in there. So the lower the FL2, the more flow you're going to have because you're pulling in all of that outside air into these ports. But if I want less flow, but more, if, if I need more FL2, then I got to cut some of that outside air out. I got to turn the water down some, right, on the Kool-Aid. So I will close them when, see how they open and then they close. So as I close them, the higher the FL2. And if I look right here, look at that, FL2 is at what? 95%. See that? This is also an aerosol, whatever, 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 right? Whatever I have on me, okay? This is just a, happens to be a bigger one. It's gonna have more, uh, more nebulizer in it because it's bigger, okay? All right, now this one even tells you the total flow. If you see that, you see the, you might not can see it, but look at the silver. See the silver? See that silver? Okay. All right, if you look at the silver, just for instance, like this first one says uh, dial in setting 35%. At 14 liters per minute, she give me a total flow of 74. All right, that's what it says up there. Now I can say you either lying or you telling the truth, right? You tell me anything. So this is what I want you to do. This third one down here says 50%, right? The one that says 50, I'm gonna tell you because you might not can see it. But it says 50% FL2 at 15 liters per minute should give you a total flow of 41 liters per minute. Tell me if that's true. 50% running at 15 liters per minute. 50%, I'll write it in the chat. 50% running at 15 liters per minute. Should equal, they say, 41 liters per minute total flow. The total flow should be 41 if it is 50% uh, running at 15 liters per minute. I just put it in the chat for you if you need it. <clears throat> they said the total flow should be 41 liters per minute. They said if you have 50% running at 15 liters per minute, the total flow should be 41. That's what it looked like it's saying, 41. Let's see if that's true. Okay, I found this on the web where if you have 50% sure, you have you that. All right, well, let's see. 50%. So 100 minus 50 is 50. And then 50 minus 20 is 20. So 50, 50 divided by 50 divided by 30 is 1.6. So 1.6 plus to 1, right? 1.6 to 1. So one, so that'd be 2.6. 2.6 is the total parts times, I said he's on 15 liters, 39. So 41, 39, same thing. So that's what they got. Cause they did the, I just did, you know, they didn't, they did the whole 0. 0.6666, you know, the more decimal you do, the more it's gonna change, right? 
So, so that's right. That's about right. Somebody said, I got 39. Shouldn't get 30. Yeah, you got 39. You're right. 39. If you just do the 1.6, right? And then do the total parts being 2.6. But if you do 2.6666666 and multiply that by 15, it will go up to 41. Okay. But that's that's where you get that from. That's where they that's how they found total flow. That's something that you can do with your own mathematical brain. Okay. You don't have to trust that that's what it says. Okay. Because it could be different. All right. So that's that. All right. So let's let's look at the Venturi systems and how they entrained air to get the FO2 that we desire. Okay. The first Venturi system is it's just a Venturi mask, which does not use water. Okay. By the way, these uh, one of these uh, whoever comes, if you take home my uh, neighbor can get all right, let me get my little stuff together. All right. The regular Venturi system looks like this. Now, they got some fancy ones, but they come in different colors. Okay? They come in different colors, and you can decide whichever one you, your, your patient needs is the color that you will use. All right. So, for instance, I it's hard. It was hard to see, but I marked on them, so they should be easier. The blue one. This is a Venturi system. Okay. You see these windows here? You're gonna notice that there's an orifice on the inside. See how little that hole is? Real little, right? See that hole in the middle? Real little. Okay. This one's saying that if you do, what is the what is the FL2 that this one say it can do? Two liters. Yes, two liters, but what's the FL2 I'm asking? 24. 24. So the blue one says, if you hook this up to two liters, I can guarantee to give you 24% FL2. Okay. What about the pink one? Now, look, look how big... Look how the middle part of the pink one. See how big that is? See that? Now, look, this one is little. So the oxygen is coming from here, right? The oxygen will be coming, guys, from the flow meter, okay? From the actual flow meter. So I'll let me take this off right quick so you can see. Okay. Let me take this off. Oxygen is going to be coming directly from the flow meter. Okay. For my Christmas tree. I might. I, I was. I don't know what I was. Yeah, so you Oh, okay. All right, so my Christmas tree, which is my nipple, let's just call it, a, call it an adapter. All right. Now, the first thing, guys, <clears throat> is coming from the oxygen. Okay? Simple as that. It's just a one large, one small bore tubing coming directly from the actual oxygen cylinder, right? So the oxygen coming out of here is 100% because it's coming straight from the source, okay? So we decide which Ventura we're going to use first, okay? Now, this one is the 24% one, right? See how small that one is? So when I hook this up, there's only going to be a little bit of oxygen coming through there, right? Because all we want is 24%, right? They say if you put this on two liters, you guarantee to get, get the patient 24%. Okay. Well, what if that's not enough? Okay, right, let's look at the pink one. The pink one, if you notice, is larger, right? Has a larger orifice. See how big that is? So let's see what the percentage is. Hold on, let me mark on it. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna mark on it.
Now they're hard to see, but I'm, I'm I'm marking on it, so you should be able to see it in a minute. All right, now look. Just look right here. 40%. 40%. So they said at eight liters. Now it's only at eight liters. If you cut the flow meter on eight liters, I guarantee to give your patient 40% FO2. Okay. All right, that's the pink one. Let's look at the yellow one. Twenty-eight percent, and I think that's four liters. Yep. So they said, and then look, now look at the hole for the twenty-eight percent. See, a little bit bigger than the twenty-four, but not as big as the forty, right? Okay. And so far and so on. The uh, green one. 35. 35, running at eight liters, right? So if you look at this, it's almost like the 40, right? Just a little bit smaller than the 40. Let's look at the orange one. Did I show you the orange one already? No. Orange one is, yeah, I think it's 50%. It's hard to see, but the orange one is 50% running at 12 liters. Let's look at the hole for the, look at that. See how big that hole is? Now look at the 50% hole compared to the 24% hole. See that little bitty hole in there? Okay, so that's more oxygen coming through. All right, so that's how we start. This is how you use the Venturis. Now, and then the white one, of course, is 31%. See, a little bit bigger than the 24, I mean the 28. And it's 31%, you can't see that one, but that's the white one. Now, with these, you have to have one piece of large bore tubing. All right, so if I'm making one myself, I use one of these. See this? You have, so say I'm gonna use 40% Venturi, okay? I'm gonna pick up the pink one, right? Because I know that's 40%. I'm gonna hook up the oxygen there. I'm gonna put the large bore tube in here. And then finally, my mask on top of here. This is a Venturi mask, very simple. As long as I'm rolling with eight liters per minute, he's gonna guarantee to get 40% FO2. It doesn't matter if he breathes a thousand times a minute or just one time a minute. Doesn't matter, because this is a high flow system. The Venturi is a high flow system which will guarantee the FIO2, okay? It will guarantee the FIO2, okay? That's the Venturi. Now, notice that they also have one that you can buy that's already put together. In the field, we like to use the ones that we do, okay? Now, I don't have the protection mechanism for this one, but there are protection mechanisms for Venturis. That's very important, and I want you to be able to tell me why. Okay, this right here is the same thing I just used, but I already put together. See, they already put it together. Somebody making money. Look at this one. It already has the FIO2s and the liters per minute. And look, all I do is just pull it down and turn it. Okay, so say I want 28%. See how 28 comes down and curves and goes down? Well, my arrow is right there on the one that leads to 28%. See that? So if I have this on here, as long as I have it turned to how many liters? Three liters. So all of these FIO2s are governed by the three liters. These FIO2s are governed by what? Six liters. That's all it is. So say they say, okay, I want you to put Mr. Johnson on a 40% Aris, I mean a 40% Venturi mask. Well, I would simply come here open this up, turn it to the 40, and it's really strange, it's about right there, right? Is that, is that the 40? Yeah, that's all, that's all it takes is a little. But so if you see the 40 goes down to about, it's about right there, something like that, and cut it on six liters, he gonna be getting 40%. So look at the windows on this one. On this one, they go by these windows, these air entrainment windows, look at this. See how that, how it's open? Look how wide open that is. That's wide open, right? Right, so I'm sucking in all kind of outside air with this one, or I can pretty much close it 
and this one doesn't give you 100%, but see how that window closed some? I can either open it or close it more, right? Look at that. See, now, if I got it closed, he pretty much getting all oxygen. So what's happening, what I want you to understand as far as the safety is concerned, oxygen coming from here. So from here, 100%, 100%, 100%. 100%, 100%, until it gets to this window. When it gets to this window, it's gonna go down to what I have set, right? And then by the time it gets to me, it is what I have set, right? Now these come with a safety device called a medicine cup. And the reason why is we put it right here. This fits down here like that. And we put the oxygen down here. Now, I can give him medicine through here at the same time, but the main thing is to protect these windows. The reason being, what if Mr. Johnson doesn't have this protection? He's a COP deer, right? You got him on 28% Venturi mass, he's doing good. You don't have the uh, protection window. Well, what if he gets cold and he puts uh, his bed sheet, his covering, the window. Now how much oxygen am I getting? Not much because it's blocking. There has a, a blockage in the tubing. Oh. He's getting more oxygen because the holes are closed or covered. Air entrainment. If I'm not entraining no outside air, I'm getting pure oxygen. Look, this is pure oxygen, 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 100%, 100%, 100%. It only dilutes when these windows pull in outside air. But if my cover is blocking the windows, well, then it's 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, straight to me. That's why you use this protection. Because if I don't, I may cause him to have O2 induced hypoventilation because his bedding, his bed sheets or his cover or his pillowcase his shirt, whatever was blocking the Venturi. That's what I'm trying to get y'all to understand. If you don't, if you block these holes, then that's 100% oxygen coming from here. Nothing's changing. The only way this goes down is if outside air gets in, right? Just like this here. If this is completely closed, how much is he getting? If these windows are completely closed coming from oxygen, he getting 100%, right? But if I open that, if I open that window up, now look how big see that, oh, that window. Now I'm sucking in outside air. And I'm gonna bleed the oxygen down. But if somebody was to come and put tape, you know, and some bandit came in the middle of the room in the middle of the night and put tape over these windows, he's gonna be getting hundred percent. Same thing with this Venturi. If I if I cover this up, I'm getting hundred percent. That's very dangerous for your COP deer. You gotta make sure that this now this is on there. Now, you know, you still could cover it, but it gives you a little bit more uh, safety, okay? So now if I got my bed sheet laying on it, it's still not completely occluding and I can still suck in some air, okay? That's what this is for. Now for the homemade one, we, had, uh, we used to have one that fit, this don't fit on the homemade, but you would have one on this one as well, okay? That is the pr principle of Venturi mass. This is your first high flow system. It's high flow because we can guarantee what? FiO2. I can guarantee the FiO2. Oh, this will go behind this ear, of course. But I can guarantee the FiO2, and it doesn't matter how he's breathing. Don't matter. It does not depend on his ventilatory pattern if it's a high flow system. He can breathe a thousand times a minute or he can breathe two times a minute. I could care less. I'm going to give him 28%, or I'm going to give him uh, 50%, or I'm going to give him 35%. What, whatever it is I decide to do, that's what he's going to get, no matter how he breathes. Understand? You got me, Brittany? Yes, sir. All right. You okay, Heather? Yes, I'm okay. All right. So that's that's the Venturi system, right? Uh, the, the, the Venturi device, which is the first high flow system. Okay. 
All right, now I'm gonna show you some different ones that they show you in the PowerPoint. Same exact principle. So what does it say about Venturi? It says the Venturi sets up a specific air entrainment ratio, which is your air to oxygen ratio, okay? Altering the flow rate will not alter the ratio. Don't forget that. It don't matter what flow I have it on, the air to oxygen parts never changes, right? What is the air to oxygen ratio of a 40% of 40%? What did I say it was? Three to one. That don't matter how much flow it's on, if it's on two liters or 10,000 liters. The oxygen itself, the FL2 itself has its own ratio. We're not talking about total flow, I'm just talking about the ratio. The ratio for uh, 40% FL2 is always going to be three to one. Okay. Uh, and I, well, I forgot which other one did. It was one to one. 60% always one to one, no matter what. So that's what they're showing. They're saying altering the flow rate does have nothing to do with the air entrainment ratio. It does have something to do with the total flow, but it got nothing to do with my air entrainment ratio. Okay. 40% will always be three to one. 60% will always be one to one, whether they own 10,000 liters or a micro needle. All right, doesn't matter. Now, all right, so here we go. Now, altering the flow rate will alter the total output. We know that. Now, if I if I turn the leader flow leader flow up some or down, that's going to alter my total flow, but it has nothing to do with my uh, my air entrainment ratio. This is a really expensive one here. This kind of looks like the one that I showed you that comes with the one you know comes with the mask. Same thing here. If you can look at it, see the arrow here showing thirty one. So at an FL two of thirty one, how many liters do they have? Do they say you have to be on? on this one. To get 31, you gotta do what? Six, right? So 28 needs to be about what? Four, 50%. If you wanna get 50% FI2, they saying took the flow to what? 15. So that's how you do. You just look at it, they all the same. They just made a little bit different. You can figure it out, okay? And then these are the ones I just showed you here, the color ones, the, the orange one is 50%. Pink one was 40, 35 for green, 31 for uh, white. 28% for the yellow one and 24% for the blue. Okay, this is where you put somebody on that needs high flow system, right? They're, they're not breathing consistently. <clears throat> they're breathing either shallow or breathing kind of fast, anxious, right? Breathing 25, 26, 27 breaths per minute. Let's just go and put them on a Venturi to make sure we good, okay? <clears throat> this is another example of the Venturi setup. I just showed it to you. It shows this collar right here. That's that entrainment collar to protect it. This is the air entrainment port where it sucks in uh, the outside air. That's air entrainment. Okay. This is another example of how they look for the color code, what I just showed you. Now, number two, the number two high flow system. The number two high flow system is a mist tent or a cruvette. You ever seen one of these? The mist tent or a cruvette. That is another high flow device. This is in your toolbox. This says nobody's toolbox for chores. This is not nurses. This is not doc. This is yours. Respiratory. You come set this kind of stuff up on your babies. Premature or just a, a baby with croup cough, sick. You know, sick baby, RSV, whatever, All right? So a mist tent, also known as a croupette, is a plastic tent that's large enough to enclose the whole child. It has a high aerosol output device. It is air conditioned, right? Primarily used to provide aerosol therapy to children with croup cough. That's that real loud barking cough that they have. What is the flow ranges for the mist tent? 12 to 15 liters per minute. Anything less than 12, you're building up what? CO2. So you need to know the mist tent is a plastic tent large enough to enclose the whole child. We use the mist tent for people, babies with croup cough and the liter flows are 12 to 15 liters per minute. How much FL2 can we give with a mist tent approximately? 40%.
And of course, I wouldn't want to use, uh, I wouldn't want to be smoking if I was a baby, first of all. And then, but you don't give the baby any kind of spark producing toys, right? Because they're going to be in there. You don't want to give them that little uh, electrical hot racer and they get to revving it up, no sparks. Catch that oxygen. Oxygen supports what? Combustion. So you don't have any spark toys. I mean, y'all might not have, but when I was younger, we had the little car that you could rev up on the ground and it sparked in the wheels. Old school toys. Uh, you don't, you don't want to use those. So that's the mist tent or croupet. That's number two, the second high flow device. The third high flow device is called an isolate. Isolate, also known as an incubator. Sometimes we call it the incubator, right? It's a chamber designed, uh, designed to provide thermally controlled, oxygen rich, humid environment for newborns. You wanna you want feel just like mama's womb. Isolate when they're not right quite ready to come out into the world, we put them in an isolate because it's heated, it says thermally, it's thermally controlled, oxygen enriched, and humid environment for newborns. And the only way you can access that baby is through holes in the sides of the isolate. Yeah, this one's an actual, yeah, actual container. And you have little places where you can stick your hands in. It's got like a little glove in there. You stick your hand through the glove and you can manipulate the baby, touch them and do whatever you need to do. That'll be respiratory. Well, one is for newborns, mostly for newborns. It's, 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 it's for newborns. The other one's for any kind of baby that has croup, right? The mist tent is, a, is, a, is for larger, a bit, little bit larger baby if they have the croup, okay? And the, the croup one is going to be cooler, air conditioned. This one is thermally controlled. It's a little warmer. So the isolate is going to be a warmer environment. It's going to be like mama, okay? It wants to feel like inside of mama. Mm -hmm. So number three is the isolate, also known as an incubator. Somebody might say an incubator. Test might say incubator. Number four, the head box. The head box is a high flow oxygen device. It's an enclosure that fits just over the infant's head. The newborn It's warm, humidified oxygen is supplied to the box by a large bore tubing. The minimum flow for the head box is seven liters per minute to flush out any CO2. If you turn up the flow too high, what's one of the problems it says if it's too high? Um, for noise, you'll scare him. He ain't gonna want to be in there, right? The older ones used to have a little hanging toy in here. You have a, a, your oxygen analyzer, which tells me how much FiO2 is actually there. Uh, you have the large bar tube, and that's bringing the oxygen in, and you have a little toy that hangs inside of there, so something for him to look at. Okay, something for him to look at. That's the head box, which is the fourth large, I mean, the fourth high flow device. All right, then we get into our aerosol. Aerosol this, aerosol that. Say that, say aerosol this, aerosol that. Say it, aerosol this, aerosol that. I don't hear nobody online. Aerosol this, aerosol that. Okay, aerosol this, aerosol that. Aerosol. Good. The reason why I want you to know that is because the aerosol starts with the aerosol. And then whatever is at the end of your aerosol setup is what it's called. Remember earlier, we did aerosol trait color. We did aerosol face tint. We did aerosol face mask, right? It's all the same. It's just a different device on the end. That's all. Okay. So, the aerosol setup must be three times patient's minute ventilation. Of course, we know that. That means we got to meet their demand, right? It says at high FIO2s greater than 60%, sometimes we have to have a tandem. That means two of them on two different cylinders blowing to the same patient if we need. Because remember, the higher the flow, the lower the what? Not there. Yeah, the higher the flow, the lower the FIO2, right? 
So if they need flow and oxygen, then we might have to have a tandem. Tandem means two. We might have to have two setups going to the same patient. That way we got all this oxygen and flow from here and another oxygen flow meter blowing in on this side to give them more FiO2, okay? Very rarely do we have tandem set up. Number three, I mean, uh, C says, cannot be set up with O2 source uh, gas at FiO2 is less than 30% approximately, depending on manufacturer, uh, set up on room air and bleed O2. Don't worry about that part. All right, it delivers high humidity along with precise FiO2. Remember, we said we can guarantee the FiO2. This is the aerosol setups, and they look, they all look different, but they're doing the exact same thing. So if you look at your screen, which is one crazy thing is, I don't know why the manufacturers use yellow. Yellow is for air, right? And that's confusing because if you see yellow on an oxygen flow meter, you're like, well, damn, what, which one is it? You know, it's, I don't know why they do that. But yellow means, means air, but some manufacturers want you to put that on the oxygen cylinder, okay? But what's important is this. I want to show you something, all right? You see what's all, let me show you what's involved. You have the large volume nebulizer. This right here is called a large volume nebulizer because it uses a lot of water, okay? And the top part is the Venturi entrainment part, okay? You have one large bar tubing and it's gonna to go to a water bag and then another large bar tubing and then whatever your patient is on. Now we're gonna set this up and I'm gonna show you now. This is the aerosol this, aerosol that, okay? Start out with your large volume nebulizer with water in it, okay? Remember, when I hook this up to oxygen, I control the Venturi ports to determine my FiO2, correct? Quick question. I've seen nurses be flabbergasted trying to figure out what the FiO2 is. One time I had a nurse had this hooked up to the airflow meter, okay? If this is hooked up to the air, room air flow meter, the yellow Thorpe tube, then does any of this matter? Does any of this matter? No, sir. No. Don't, don't matter. Because if they on air flow meter, they're only getting what? 21%. Say it again. If they on an air flow 20, meter. 21%. 21%. Good. So I've seen them have this screwed on to the yellow flow meter, right? and say, well, he on 28%. Like, no, he's not on 28%. Well, they say 28%, well, so what? He's on the airflow meter. So he's only getting 21%, okay? So be careful, because a lot of times they'll do that. That's why I don't even like that the colors uh, even allow you to do that, okay? But if you have, I don't have the flow, do I have a flow meter here? I don't have the flow meter. All right, so looking at this aerosol setup, let's look at this one first. We have the large volume nebulizer, okay? Your next thing you have to have is the large, large uh, bore tubing. This is called large bore tubing. The other was small bore. This is small bore tubing. This is large bore tubing. So the first thing, you always work yourself from the this to the patient. That's the way you set it up. Don't be trying to do him first and coming back. Start from the nebulizer to the patient. So first thing first, hook up your nebulizer, okay? So we're gonna hook up our large volume nebulizer for our high flow device. I gotta take this. A Christmas tree mess all because I got to screw directly to the flow meter. So I hook this up to the flow meter, screw it in real good. Okay, I'm gonna turn it on. Let's just say I'm gonna I'm gonna first do aerosol face mask at 28%. Okay, running at 12 liters per minute. I'm gonna cut this to 12. All right, 
That's 12 liters per minute at 28%. Next step is my large bar tubing. My first large bar tubing. Large bar tubing goes there. And this is the other end here, okay? Now, as this water and aerosol is going through there, eventually it's gonna start collecting, right? Called rain out. And so what's gonna happen? What if, if that rains out, it's gonna go down my tray, right? And drown me. So in that case, now you might can see, can you see the, the mist coming out of there? See that? Okay, see how fast it's coming out? It's a lot of flow because I got such low FiO2. 28%, so it's a lot of flow. Now watch it if I, when I cut the flow, uh, when I cut the flow down some, oh no, when I cut the FL2 up some, watch what happens to the flow. See how, that, see how slow that's coming out now? It's got 98% FL2, this is 98% oxygen, but the flow is damn near gone, right? Because when I increase the FL2, you decrease the flow. So let me increase it back again. Okay. See it now? How fast it's coming? Okay. So I got my large bar tubing, and then now I need something to trap that water. And that's called a water bag. I need my water trap. Uh, Do you use sterile water or just regular tap water? I use sterile water. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to come already sterile, distilled or whatever. So now I have my water bag. So that's going to, any kind of condensate that comes out of here is going to get caught in the bag. So I don't want that to come to me. All right? Now I need my second large bore tubing right here. Goes on there just like that. And then finally, whatever I said it is, aerosol this, aerosol that. And I said I was going to make an aerosol face mask, right? So I find a face mask, regular little face mask, and put it on. This is a 28% aerosol face mask running at 12 liters per minute. Okay? Cut it down because it's kind of loud. Let's just say that's 12 because I can't hear me. This is a aerosol face mask running at 12 liters per minute. Okay. Hold on, let me let my daughter know I'm a little behind. All right, now let's do something else. Aerosol this, aerosol that, right? Okay, so it's the same setup. 28% aerosol, let's leave. What if I'm gonna use a person that doesn't have a upper airway, he has a trachea, a tracheostomy, right? Like this gentleman, he has a tracheostomy. So I can't just sit here and hold it like that, right? I have to use what's called a trach collar, okay? This right here is a trach collar, also known as a trach mask. See that? This is a trach mask right here or trach collar. So if I put this on here, this now becomes an aerosol trach collar, that's it. With the mask, it was an aerosol face mask. With this, it's an aerosol trach collar, right? If I have a face tint on it, it's an aerosol face tint. If I use a T piece, it's an aerosol T piece. Same thing. Okay, that's, that's yeah, that's pretty much it. So this we're going on him like this. So this is the trach mask. It's got a little snap. So I just put this over his trach or around it back here and snap it in place. Right? And then I put my my tubing. Right here. This is an aerosol trait collar. 
it up. Start from the machine all the way down to your patient. You have your large volume nebulizer, which has the water, one large bar tubing, a reservoir bag, another large bar tubing, and then whatever it is, you're going to have them on. That's what you got to be able to do in the lab. Okay? Same thing with this one. Now you say, well, I don't like that yellow one. Right? Well, that's fine. It's the same situation with, uh, with, the, with the blue one. Right? It's all the same using the Venturi principle. So I'm just take, I don't, if I don't want to use this one, I'm take that one off and I can use the big boy. Okay? Same thing. Screw him in. Turn them up. Right? Put my large bar tubing onto the large body nebulizer. The other, then I have to have my drain bag and then my other large bar tubing to my device. This is still an aerosol trade collar. Okay, aerosol trade collar. All right, one more thing and we're going to go. I might have to do it tomorrow. I don't have my face tint. I'll show you the face tint and all that tomorrow. So it's either aerosol face tint, aerosol tea piece, aerosol trait collar, aerosol uh, face mask, right? It depends on whatever you put on there. This all the same thing, the high flow system. This is the, you got the high flow system that's not aerosol, like the mist tint. Well, that's kind of aerosol, but the, the, um, the regular Venturi mask is dry, right? But then you have the mist tint, you got the crew fed, you got the, the, uh, the, uh, the isolate, you got uh, aerosol this and aerosol that, okay? These are your high flow devices, okay? When you have your, and we're gonna learn more about it tomorrow, but when you have your lab, I'm going to say, uh, put Mr. Smith on an aerosol trait collar of 35% running at 10 liters per minute, and then tell me the total flow. So you're going to go hook it up, just like I just did, turn it on, and then go to the board and write down the total flow. You got it. That's it. Okay? That's it on that part. So tonight, look over your Venturi uh, question in your uh, in your reading. Make sure you're doing your reading now. Go to that book, read, and understand. Highlight so you can understand high flow device, low flow device. All right. What and because we're we not finished with it. Let me see what tomorrow when we come in tomorrow. <clears throat> I just showed you this is the aerosols, right? This is the aerosol what we're doing right now. Then we're going to talk about cascades. And then we're going to get into the hyperbaric chamber, right? We already talked about what that's doing, but I'm going to show you the hyperbaric chamber and how it looks when you get in it and stuff like that. So do your reading for your high flow, your low flow devices. Good job today. I'm proud of the ones that looked at this stuff last night because you are where you need to be. Uh, <clears throat> the magic box. Just get you uh, practice. Make it up tonight. Right? Just say, okay, I won't put my dog on a 60% aerosol bark mask at 25 liters per minute. And then tell yourself what the total flow is. Just practice and you will get you got it. All right. It's all the same. All right. Now, homework for tonight is already in the system, in the module. Okay. Homework is in the module already. I think it is homework number, let's see, one and two. Okay. Homework number one and two, which is already in the module. Let's see here. Yeah, medical gas. Therapy. So look at this, guys. You did the pop quiz today. I'm gonna let you do the. Uh, uh, Brittany, I'll let you do the pop quiz in a, in a moment. I want everybody's gone. So when everybody's gone, Brittany, you can hang on so you can do it. Um, Yesterday's live lecture that I gave you last night is here. Look at this right here, guys. Medical gas therapy part one. That's part of the lab. And part two, look at that lab. It showed you doing the same thing I just did. It showed me doing it, talking about it. 
so you can learn it. It's not too early to learn it because Thursday is your lab and your exam. All right. Uh, this is the PowerPoint right here that we're learning now. If you want to look ahead a little bit, you can. This is the magic box form. Show you how to do the magic box. A couple of NBRC uh, board exam type questions if you want to play with that. Of course, the note taking guide and a case study picture. Uh, this case study picture, when we get to the end, we'll do this together. It's kind of like put everything together. All right. After this test, you want to go into humidity and aerosol therapy, which really kind of uh, overlaps this last part, talking about aerosol this, aerosol that, same thing, okay? Uh, just, just a little bit in depth. After that though, guys, it's pharmacology. That's when the monsters come in with pharmacology. A lot of mad, a lot of medicine, okay? Pharmacology is one of the hardest ones you will have in RT210, all right? So tonight, do your homework. What, I'm gonna sure I saw you see homework. Where is it at? Oh, yeah, day two. So tonight, yeah, tonight right here, RT assignment, day two. Do that tonight by midnight, and that'll be your attendance for today, okay? And then tomorrow we will come back into uh, the rest of the lesson. Rest of the lesson, which is the PowerPoint, talking about hyperbaric chambers and oxygen analyzers and all of that. So there's not a lot to left to go. Tomorrow is what, Wednesday? Yeah, so we need to complete it up tomorrow and uh, be prepared to test up and uh, lab up on Thursday. So it's a lot left. I need you guys to really, really take serious tonight. Don't play with it. Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow at the same time.